Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about digital production, and we have a great panel when it comes to cloud production, uh, you know, getting things into the cloud, getting them out of the cloud, talking about AWS, talking about uh, other cloud uh, sources, talking about all of those things. We've got a great panel here. So if you've got questions around that, definitely throw those in there. Our second hour, we're really excited to have Epifan on. So the team from Epifan, as well as Andy Carluccio from Zoom, are going to be on here to talk about uh, Epifan Connect and how it works with Zoom and all the cloud tools and edge devices that Epifan um, is rolling out in conjunction with Zoom. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, so we'll see that in the second hour. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we got? First question comes to us this morning from Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona. And Jack says, how do you confirm you have audio video going to air when streaming? Testone.io looks like a good option. I go ahead, Courtney. I haven't looked at Testone.io. You know, the typical uh, broadcast situation is, you know, you go to one of these uh, broadcast either color bars or one of those broadcast test patterns, you know, the big chief that'll let you check your resolution and all that and a thousand cycle tone. I wouldn't leave that up for more than about 10 seconds because it gets annoying if you're testing streaming where people are already tuned in. I'd go with, uh, I'd find a nice uh, uh, public domain uh, video loop of something with a lot of waves and trees in it so you can check your encoding, make sure it's getting through without micro blocking and some nice uh, music from Stephen Foster or something that is now in the public domain. I go ahead, Jay. That's a great answer, Courtney, and I completely disagree. Um, mostly because uh, if you're not testing with what you're sending out, you're not testing. So if you are sending out uh, video and audio, then you're testing and you've got a, a true signal flow. As far as a confirmation to the far end, yes, uh, slightly, maybe a slate with a beep on it. Uh, we have a, a couple that we've built over the years and we'll test them to go out of our replay system. So we have an A and a B or a red and blue, depending on the system that it's in. And so we'll change those back and forth and rotate through those. I've actually been testing signals on one of my systems for the last 12 hours doing recordings. And I'm, I, I have a full color flow uh, from our Sienna processing engine, which actually, and this is a key point, is if you just put bars and tone in a streaming test, you're not going to get a full resolution test. You need something that moves. And that, that's my point with having real video and audio is make sure it moves and it's doing exactly the same thing. For me, whenever we're doing live tennis, uh, there's not a lot of movement. It's just like one person, right? So that's not as much. But if I really want to push the actual connection, I'll put on this color flow, which is every pixel changing all the time. And so that helps really, really stress the connection. So you can see if it's really going to break or not. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, we use a, uh, we don't have a lot of mechanisms to test anywhere. You know, we've got the stream that goes out in the, in the end thing. And so when we're stressing it, we're not really testing it's more along the lines of confirming that we're actually getting a signal and we've got basically it's a looping pattern that's got a lot of moving elements and some audio to it that um confirms that we're you know we're sending what we're supposed to see and, and if someone tunes in they know that okay the, the broadcast is going to start soon and yeah, go ahead uh, Jonas. yeah so it's funny the test term is mentioned that's one of the small tools we build for lineup where like we have multiple streams going to all the different platforms and doing testing, you need to find out, hey, where's, where's something where? So what's really cool is um, this version has a talk in it. So you can like enter, this is channel one TX2 and it's gonna beep and then it's gonna say its name and then it's gonna beep again. We do that for when we do multi-language routing, we have all the languages there we have. Uh, so that way you, this is, it depends what you want to test. If you want to test your encode, then you need something like Jeff is saying. But if you know your encode is good, then and your bandwidth is good, the next thing is to make sure that you have all the right streams going anywhere. And that's where we build this little test site. It can generate uh, tone at any level, left, right, so you can check audio. Uh, yeah, and then like have a color bar in there so you can check on a scope if you're actually delivering the right color. Go ahead, Jeffrey. <clears throat> and it's very important that you test in the area that you're going to go live on. You don't you don't test on YouTube and then go live on Facebook. Uh, and you can always test a lot of these uh, a lot of these social networks have 
the uh, ability to check your test before you go live because you're checking your audio, you're checking your video, but you're also checking your bandwidth, which is also important. Uh, that's why I like with YouTube because then you can right click and go stats for nerds and then see what, uh, what bandwidth is coming through and how that's going to affect your audio and video overall. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, uh, things like, you know, for audio, I still like, uh, uh, Test Tone's a great one, but I also like uh, Skype. Uh, that's still a, that's still a great one to check to make sure your audio is coming through perfect. And then, of course, Zoom has the audio and video or the audio tests. You can just definitely check the video from Zoom as well. Yeah, for a lot of us, uh, if we're building up a big stream, you know, this oftentimes this is something we build up for days uh, or at least a couple hours <laughs> before the event. And so we're trying to run our encoders as was stated before, we're trying to exercise our encoders in the entire pipeline as much as we possibly can. Um, uh, you know, if I get on site, the first thing I want is internet power and I get those encoders on, you know, like just, just turn them on. And because what I want to see in the back end is I want to see my uh, information about, am I seeing any drops? And I can't do that just to turn it on. I want to see if I see any drops over as, as Jeff was re referring to three hours, eight hours, 10 hours, 24 hours, just run it and look at that and look at the network graphs to make sure that I that I'm not seeing anything unusual across that piece. The the test signal that I send out at least um, before it has bars and tone, you got to be careful with bars and tone because it, you can get a strike on YouTube <laughs> with bars and tone. Um, it's like NBC has it or something like that or Paramount. Um, so be careful with that. But but I use in general when I'm streaming out, I do bars and tone um, and the tone is important because I'm trying to make sure that the output tone at full volume on the far end is the same as what I'm sending in. So, so I, I actually want to know that my levels are correct on the output device um, and, and what it's looking at there. Then I have a sync test. And that's usually just some dots that go across to let me know that I'm in sync. Now I have a channel check. I do a lot of stuff that has more than two channels. Um, so I might have 514, 714, 916. And so I'll call it, you'll hear me, you'll hear me calling out the channels. And oftentimes uh, you'll hear, I have another one where uh, I have a female voice, uh, in this case, oftentimes my wife, that says left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, and that means because I'm sending out one stereo in the ladder as well as 916 or 514, um, if you're getting stereo, you hear one thing. And if you're getting um, surround, you get another. Uh, so your channel check stress ocean. I shoot a lot of oceans for that. Um, color test, which is pure colors, red, green, blue. Um, and it's because uh, some things will... Uh, especially H.264 will destroy pure colors, and we want to see what what's going what it's going through the system. Um, those are round, and the reason we're doing that is we're looking for aliasing along the edges. Um, then motion blur slash interlay. So I have something with two things going opposite directions, so that I can see whether I'm getting interlace anywhere in the path, as well as motion as well as it's very hard to encode that, and so it's. Um, so I, I look at that, and so those are the things that I do. That's a test that goes out all the time. And then in the field, as what everybody, or almost everybody said here is turn the camera on <laughs> like and start streaming to something that is the same CDN, but it, you know, lets you do it. Now, right before the show, the way we figure this out, the best way to do it is make sure that whatever your content is before the show um, has audio and video in it, has moving video and audio in it. So your countdown clock should have things that are moving. Your, um, your, you, you should have some music. We, I know we don't do that in this show, but oh, we do. We do. You hear it talking. So, um, but, but you want to hear that. And the best way to do that is a pre-show. So you start off with something that has a little bit of graphics or, or something that is going to have music and something moving for a minute or two. Then you go into a pre-show. The reason is if, there, if you have any audio in the field that's a problem in the pre-show, you're going to get to it before you get to the meat of the show. Um, so, you, so having that, that's a little bit more of a disposable thing. So th that's how we approach um, that process. Go ahead, Jeff. It, you got me thinking about testing things with tone. Uh, I spent three hours day before yesterday, teching out a system that we were sending to Zoom. Uh, the, it was a, one of the large virtual events that we did. It didn't work. And, yeah. Zoom, Zoom, Zoom's echo cancellation turns off the, the Oh, tone. it does. Yes, <laughs> it, it does. We, it's we chased that rabbit for hours. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> hours. I, I, everyone does the first time. <laughs> well, it's not the first time. I, oh, okay. I'm, I'm really slow. I'm from Texas. Oh. And, uh, you know, I didn't learn my lesson. And, and then it clicked on me about halfway through. I'm like, oh, yeah. wait a second. Yeah, exactly. I remember that now. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> All right. Next question. Alex Lindsay, somebody with that name from Nevada, California, says, has anyone seen the Elemental Media Connect gateway? And there's a link to it. I got Jonas. Yeah, so it's an interesting 
thing there. Basically, are building a you see it in a different name. Some call it a venue gateway where you're able to uplink multiple streams. But this seems to be more on the delivery side than the production side of uh, the workflow. It allows you to uh, grab multiple multicasts and uplink them to the cloud where you then can put that to your distributors. So pretty neat. Hopefully we'll get one that also allows us to, I don't know, get NDI or SDI or sources like that and uplink them to NDI, SDI in Media Connect. Yeah, so the, I mean, the, the big thing here is that a lot of us have been asking Elemental for this for a long time. And and what the issue is, is that we get everything into the cloud. We might have a, we might have a link, you know, the Elemental link or we have something else. We get into the cloud, we transport it, but how do we get it back out again? <laughs> like, how do we get it to, to come out the other end? And so what this does um, is, uh, it's only been out for, I think, a couple of weeks or released to the public in the last couple of weeks. Um, but what it does, unless you build your own PC, you just build your own PC, Linux or PC, and you have a video card and it just pumps out SDI. So you can point, you can point at uh, AWS at it and it's going to, it's going to push out SDI. You know, for me, that's that uh, it may do other things. But that's what I know how to do uh, with it. And so, um, so it's an interesting, uh, interesting little um, addition. Uh, next question. Chris Widener is up next from Lafayette, Indiana. And Chris says, what is your go-to site to clean metadata from photos when you want to post from an iPhone on the go? I don't know of a website that I would use for that. Um, most of that metadata is in the photo and it's you can you can access it. I don't know how to do it on the on the iPhone, to be honest. Uh, I, I know that if you open it in photos on a desktop, you'll immediately see the metadata. I'm not sure exactly how to get to that metadata um, on the iPhone. Go ahead, Bill. The only thing I've been able to do, and it's unsatisfactory, is to do a screen cap and then send that out as opposed to the original photo. The problem with it is on an iPhone on a mobile device, you generally, unless you're working on a big iPad, I, I'm suspicious of the amount of resolution I can get out of that. And I'm thinking I'm going to lose some quality and maybe get some interface like on the iPhones, that little pill shape thing that's there. Oh. So it's not a good solution. If you just want to try to get something in strip metadata and send it out exactly as it was. I don't have a good solution yet for that. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I, I don't have a really good solution either, but I just wanted to follow up on Bill's. You know, I get a lot of um, photos from our student athletes that that are screen capped. Uh, they, they pulled it up and they've just screen capped their iPhone. And so it's got all the, the bars on it. And so that's a good way to get a photo out that doesn't have any metadata on it. But if you're going to do that, just make sure that you're cropping out all the, the iPhone uh, UI. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. So if you're on an Apple device, uh, there is an app called Exif Metadata where you can change, you can rename, and you can remove all metadata. I'll put the link in, in Makana. All right, next question. Next question comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul says, Google researcher in leaked doc, quote, but the uncomfortable truth is we aren't positioned to win this arms race and neither is open AI. While we've been squabbling, a third faction has been quietly eating our lunch. Close quote. Please discuss. Go ahead, John. Yeah, this article came out this week. This is mostly clickbait, this article. They're talking about stability. Stability.ai is the largest open source platform on the market. They've talked about, and Paul's got another question here that's almost identical to this one. Uh, Stability is working on some some less resourceful large language models that will app, will run on a phone, but we're a long way from that. We're actually playing with some of those models right now, um, but but Google's not showing their hand yet. They've got a lot of stuff under the hood, and OpenAI with Microsoft behind them. There's two powerful guys, and and we're just starting. So I I think this is mostly a clickbait uh, column. Go ahead, Courtney. I don't know if this is related, but there's been a lot of stuff in the news lately about Jeffrey Hinton, who was deemed the father of AI, who left Google <clears throat> to protest, uh, to to promote slowing down development of AI. But he says it's really not possible in the interview I saw. And he said that, you know, any agreement that you might come to between all the different developers, uh, you know, China, is China going to slow down development on AI? Probably not. So uh, it's uh, it's never going to work to have any kind of legislation or anything or agreement between entities of all the different developers of AI systems to uh, put the brakes on or non-compete. You know, that's not going to work. Hey, go, Jeffrey. So what I've read from this article is that it's it's basically just he's saying that Google doesn't have the ability or the 
uh, or is, is falling behind from what's called the oh, it's the open source of AI, and that's that's always true. Uh, but then again, Google's always been an acquiring company, so they could easily find a company that's willing to sell. And uh, and then they're right back into this uh, race for AI. So I'm, yeah, it is definitely clickbait, and I'm I'm not too worried about it. I'm pretty sure Google's already looking for solutions and talking with people to uh, get back to where they are. It's I, I always call it like antivirus. One day this antivirus is better than the other one. The next day new a new uh, virus comes out, so this antivirus becomes better than the other one. It just goes back and forth. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. I, I think that the, the real problem is, is that, number one, is that because it's open source, it's going to be very hard to put the cat back in the bag. And I'm sure that was part of the original design. <laughs> so, so the original design was by making it open source, by la laying it all out there, it makes it very hard to, you know, you can't just legislate out of it because everything's in the in the wild. Um, and so I think that that has been a big piece of it. I think Google's challenge really is open AI has really moved out into the front. And with Microsoft investment, there's nowhere to go. Well, you know, and so um, so I think that uh, right now the the you know, but there's still going to be lots and lots of individual leaders that that could pop out. We're seeing, you know, things like Scenario.gg um, is doing you know game you know focusing on game assets, and then you have ones that are focusing on deep you know deep fakes or respeech and and other things. So you, there's lots of focuses that are still going to be popular. They will all get gobbled up over the next five or ten years, and so we'll end up with you know, two or three behemoths, but I think it'd be very, I, I don't even know if our legislators are technically capable of having, you know, creating a law that would, <laughs> that would do this. I mean, so it, it'll be really interesting to see. Next question. Graham Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland is up next. And Graham says, I'm trying to capture a short interview clip off a TV news website. It's only 20 seconds long, but how do I capture both vision and sound? I know I can screen capture on my Mac, but that's vision only. Any apps you could suggest? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, I, I'm not on Mac, I'm on PC, but the app I use is on both. And I, I use it, uh, it's called Snagit by TechSmith. And it's a great tool for screen capping for capturing, basically capturing anything on your screen, whether it's a still or a video, and then you can draw things over it and whatnot if you want as well. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. So the two that I often go to on the Mac are uh, either just regular QuickTime, and then you use Loopback to pull the audio into a QuickTime capture. Loopback's a great tool to have. Loopback and its companion piece are are kind of daily users for me. The other way I do it is Screencast will allow you to pick up your system audio and save it into an a screencast record. So those are two solutions that work. Courtney? As I always say, get you a standalone uh, capture box that uh, records onto a USB stick. It takes HDMI. This one happens to take HDMI or analog in if you want to capture some old VHS tapes uh, onto a digital format. But this just plugs into anything that has an HDMI output and can capture and encode an H.264 and delivers an MP4 file. Uh, I always have some of these hooked up to anything in my stream. So if I see something, you just hit one button, it records. Uh, hit the button again, it stops, and you get a 1080p recording that's suitable for upload to YouTube or use in, in any of your speeches or anything like that. Yeah, and, and on a Mac, you have to be careful because a lot of screens will go black when you try to capture them. So it's in the operating system to, to, to protect copyright. So if you try to do that with, for instance, YouTube TV, it'll, you'll just, it, this just happened recently. I mean, I think, I don't know whether it was YouTube, Chrome, YouTube, or Apple, but now if you try to capture that screen, it goes black. But if you run it through an external recorder like Courtney's, that, um, I use a PIX240 because I have one laying around, but that's about as much overkill as you could possibly have to capture something there. Um, but um, but H.264 capture, uh, you can just hit record and, and get it. And it really, if you're going to do any amount of this, you want a hardware recorder. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, that's a DHCP is what Alex is talking about. Uh, and that, of course, only exists on uh, uh, digital inputs from the HDMI cable. Uh, that's why the analog inputs are cool. If you do have uh, analog output on any of your video equipment, that has no copyright protection. But a lot of these uh, little capture recorders have a secret. They say it supports uh, HDCP and will not record something if the copyright bit is set in the digital stream, like what uh, Alex was talking about, because several of the streaming devices like Chromecast or uh, um, you know Fire TV, et cetera, may set that copyright bit on everything that comes out of it. So it can only play into video monitors. 
but there's a secret way to turn it off on a lot of those. You just hold down the record button for like 10 seconds and it suddenly will pass HDCP and coded stuff through. So uh, look on the forums for the particular hardware recorder that you got and see if there's a way to defeat the HDCP. If there's not, there are some splitters that are available from China that they don't mention the fact that they do that, but an HDMI splitter that will strip off the HDCP so you can record instead of getting a black screen. Next question. Next one comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul says, discuss these open source personal AI, de AI developments, scalable personal AI, responsible release, and multimodality. The science Q&A was trained in an hour that rival Google and open AI. And uh, I guess this was sourced from another leaked doc. Go ahead, John. Uh, just go go read everything that the stability guys are, are saying and, and the, the CEO. Emod is 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 a quite a smart guy, and he'll give you a glimpse of what they're working towards. The other community site is huggingface.co. You can bounce around in there and look for hours and hours. Hugging face is that what they really? Hugging face. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Somebody came from branding at a diaper company. Yeah. Uh, Alexander Knight, Vancouver, BC, here on the panel says, even though some YouTube creators use high-end cameras, I noticed color banding due to compression on their colored backdrops, which ruins things. Is this just a YouTube issue that cannot be avoided? Go, Jeffrey. Uh, no, actually, what it's probably happening is, first of all, I, I, there are some creators out there that should really just don't care uh, because they've got thousands of people watching them on a daily basis. They're churning out content left and right. They probably have an advertiser that says, hey, we got this LED light and, and here you go and, and put it in on there and talk about our show. And they don't care well, what it looks like on, on YouTube so because they don't really watch the show. They just know that they're going to get a lot of clicks and they're going to get a lot of uh, a lot of cash off of that deal. So, uh, so they just put out their content and go from there. Uh, it's all about the encoding, how you how you encode that and post it up to YouTube. You should you should really research what YouTube uses for their encoding and then follow those uh, numbers if that's where you're going. Of course, if you're posting to YouTube and TikTok and Facebook, you know they all have different profiles that you ha also have to be concerned about uh, from there. But th it's also about the device that's that's being watched on. Older TVs, if I have a 20, 2012 uh, machine, when I watch my YouTube videos on that uh, machine, the, it, the video just looks horrible because it, can, it does not have the right monitor, it does not have the right graphics in there to really uh, hold the uh, colors that uh, I have or, or at any YouTube for that matter. So those are some of the factors that are involved in that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that happen in generally in gradients. You know, so colored backgrounds are gradients. And the problem is, is that you are traveling a very, you're going very, very slowly over a long distance, you know, in the curve. And the question is, is do you have enough steps in the 8-bit slash compression to d describe that, that there? So if your gradient is too subtle, it basically can't get to the next part because it, it's, it's a, like, it's, it'll say, well, it's this color until the next color until the next color. And that's what you're seeing in banding is that it can't, and compression will add that as well. Um, and so if they up, up load 10 bit, they actually should be able to, you, you can upload 10 bit to uh, YouTube and you will get a 10 bit output um, and you can get rid of a lot of that banding. But most people don't know how to do that. <laughs> so so, so it, you don't get, um, that 10 bit doesn't get uploaded. And the big the big thing is not to put gradients behind you if you can avoid it, if, if, if that's something that, that matters to you. Uh, in Zoom, we have the same, uh, you know, challenges because it's, of course, getting compressed to for WebRTC. So, so that's the, um, you know, the other challenge there. But yeah, gradients are a little bit of a challenge. It's one of the reasons that I kind of moved away from gradients a little bit on mine was because of the, of that, um, that, that challenge there. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, just a quick question. And hopefully I'm describing this properly that it actually, what I was seeing was color banning, but somebody just had like a plain wall behind them and they had lit it so it was just one yep. solid color but i could see like swirly artifacts there on the wall it just has well it, swirly artifacts i'm not sure exactly what that is but generally any any change of the color or the brightness over a long distance but not very much color change is going to create banding in an 8-bit space uh go ahead courtney yeah, the other thing you can see if it's a solid color uh is macro blocking which uh it, it will try and maintain the same uh, 
uh, compression in the same smooth area. But as over time, you'll see it recompressing. You'll see little blocks of squares that are kind of dancing around in the solid color behind them. And that's that's uh, a form a uh, artifact of compression. And it may either it may not just be on the encode. It may be on your decode if you've got a lower bandwidth. A lot of times, uh, Google, I mean, uh, YouTube can switch to a lower bandwidth player and it'll switch between its different encodes to a lower bandwidth one if you've got a lot of network congestion on your node that you're hooked up to because it measures uh, the speed, your speed of reception and switches its uh, its bit rate accordingly to a, a lower, uh, you know, a, a lower uh, speed compression uh, to yep. get through. Next question. Next one comes to us from Tlaloc Lopez Waterman in Salisbury, Maryland. And Tlaloc today says, has there been any movement on feature requests with Unity comms? He's interested in more PLs and possibly an API. Go ahead, Jeff. Comms is one of my favorite conversations all the time. And uh, I think, as everybody knew, with with the pandemic and everybody moving to remote production, uh, especially in our industry, uh, Unity comms blew up. It just completely, I would say, more than quadrupled. I mean, just really just blew up in their business. And so I think the hardest thing to get new development and things like that is finding where Chuck is on what beach because he's probably still sitting there enjoying that margarita without salt. I, I mean, he did great, but there's just been zero movement forward at all. Yeah, the hard part is, is that it's... It's really inexpensive. So it's a, you know, Unity is really inexpensive. So there's you have to jump to the next thing, and the next thing is a big jump up. So that's been what's kept a lot of people on that on inside of Unity. I don't think that I think that they fundamentally believe that that's the correct number of of PLs. I don't think that this is a technical limitation. They just don't think that it's important. And so as a result, I don't think that we're ever going to get anything better than what we have now. I mean, we'll see minor adjustments, but I I will be blown away if we see anything you know, significant come out of, out of this. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, I just have a question for you, Alex. You mentioned that unity is inexpensive and is it inexpensive for what it is, or is it inexpensive for a comm solution? Cause to me, it seems like what they offer and what they charge is it's, it's fine. It's like, it, I, I don't think that it's like that it's inexpensive, it, you know, it's cause it doesn't well, compare compared to, to all the other, other options. It's really inexpensive, you know, like well, I, right, I but, yeah. But the other options are way more feature rich and better. And so, do you know what yeah, I mean? It's like, yeah, but I mean, yeah, so the value is there. If, if you're, you know, so when I'm doing, you know, the, when I'm when I'm doing some of the bigger bigger shows that we do that I need more control, of course we're using I use Clearcom for those. And some people use Riedel for those. Other people use RTS. Um, you know, RTS tells me that they're they're from a truck. <laughs> like, you know, like it's like oh you're from trucks, and Clearcom tells me that that you are uh, from events, and Riedel tells me that you have a lot of money. So so the um, so those are the three. That's how I know wh wh who I'm dealing with by who what they what piece of hardware they put in front of me. But the big thing is. When you start getting into real productions, you need more PLs. You need more PLs available to you in front of you. You need, you want some of them to be hardware where it makes sense to make them hardware. You can have, but it's great to have some of them that can be on a PC or a, or a, and, and for a long time, one of the problems we had was that, um, that Clearcom didn't have a PC and Mac version so that you, you know, that, but they have it now. Um, the iPad version of, of, you know, um, the iPad version of, Agent IC, from my perspective, is the best, you know, um, mobile version. I mean, the, the Android slash iOS version of that, um, because I can have any collection of directs or PLs. So on an iPad, I can open it up and have 24, P I have 24 keys. They're all there. I don't have to switch pages. Oh my gosh. Anyway, um, and then, um, and, and they're all there and I can have a, a group of directs, uh, PLs, whatever I want. I can build those all in, you know, it's just, it's a lot simpler. Um, we do use Unity uh, for stuff because it is easy to send somebody. It's less expensive, um, you know, to have lots of licenses. Um, and so, uh, but, but it's, it's um, it, you, you know, you can feel it all the time. <laughs> like if you've used Clearcom, uh, which we may start using for office hours, um, you, you can feel the difference between Unity. If you have never used it, don't, don't, don't use it once because going back to Unity is really hard. Uh, go ahead, Jonas. So I uh, checked their website, and uh, I'm sure everybody's going to be really excited about this. They are changing part of their features to a subscription model. So uh, Uni Unity Protect becomes Unity Pro, 
And with that, you get a couple more options. You get channel volume control, so you can uh, change the volume Stunning. per each of the channels, and you get persistent channels, which I don't even know how that will work, but apparently you can uh, keep listening and talking to channels that you don't see. Because that sounds like a great idea, and nobody will ever forget that they still have a channel on in another PL um, and the data encryption. So we'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, I need, not great. I need more PLs on the same page. <laughs> like, like you know, like it's it's always going to be like a well, we'll use it for now until I get more PLs on the same page. That the round circle little weird thing is something that you know it's it's fine. Like I, but I know that I'm just using the cheap option every time I turn it on when I see that. Now go ahead, Jeff. I would I completely agree with a lot of what you said, Alex. And I would say that there are more cost not say more cost effective, but similarly cost effective. The new uh, Telos uh, VIP intercom is actually pretty much in line when you start comparing a lot of users and its capabilities are closer to Asian IC or the uh, yeah. the VCOM that we've been using for years too. And I I've used Unity. I've had I have a large server. I've I've had it for probably nine or ten years. Just kept adding to it and adding to it when need to be. But there are definitely better options out there for full features. Yeah, and we're going to bring on both uh, ClearCom and um, uh, Telos to talk about their comms specifically. So we'll we'll have them on in, in the next couple of months. Uh, next question. Alexander Knight, Vancouver, BC, Canada says, anyone on the panel have experience using the custom video mode on Lumix cameras? I create a preset and notice that when the camera turns on, it doesn't seem to properly load the profile. Go ahead, Jonas. So I haven't had that issue, but what is interesting with Panasonic sometime, um, turning it off, like for some it means like pulling the power plug, for some it means like holding the power button for a long time or like switching the power off and then turning it on. It really depends on how you do it. Like the BGH1 really wants you to like power it down to save settings before you like remove its power and then like power it on with like just power again. It's yeah, it's a bit weird sometimes. And I think with the smaller GH5s and all that, it's similar. So you might want to check in that and like switch to another profile, say, and then turn it off, turn it on, switch back to the profile. But yeah, haven't had that problem. Go, Jeff. I was going to echo exactly the same thing. They, my, our BGH ones, I love them and hate them at the same time. But turning them on, sometimes they'll power up over PoE, sometimes they won't. And we've never figured out the in that also equates to whether or not the settings we made in it using the tether software, whether that saved or not. It, yeah, there's definitely a workflow gap there that somebody said, oh, this or the, either they missed a check mark or they said, oh, this would be a better idea. We'll just make them turn it off with the button. Ours are 30 feet in the air. We can't just reach up to grab it. So we got to climb a scaffold or find a, a, a forklift and, or, a le, or a ladder lift or something like that. So. Uh, yeah, I've noticed weirdness like that, especially with holding settings, powering on and off. Go on, Alexander. Now that I think of it, and I got to test this to confirm, but I think it started when I realized I, I wanted to make some changes. And when I saved it, I was the dial on the top of the camera was still set to custom mode. So one thing I guess I need to do is try switching it back to manual video mode, make the changes, save it to the custom profile, then change the dial back to custom mode, power cycle it and see if it if it sticks. So I haven't actually verified it. Yeah, that so that's another weirdness with the that. Like you need to save it to the custom mode. If you are in the custom mode and change settings, they are some are it seems like some are automatically saved, but not all of them. So make sure you're safe to custom again. Good, Courtney. I'm not sure exactly how the Lumix works, but I know on some of the Canons, make sure you have an SD card in it because some of the times when they they have uh, setting up a custom mode, it saves that uh, profile out to the SD card so that you can transport it to other cameras and load that custom mode into other cameras. So make sure it's not set to save that to the SD card and make sure you have an SD card in it. And may, that may be what the problem is. It may have internal flash that it saves it to as well and the, how you save it, how you turn it off determines whether whether or not it's saved and where it's saved. Next question. 
Next one comes to us from Roscoe Jones in uh, Madison, Indiana. And Roscoe says, DIT, digital imaging technicians, and DMTs, data management technicians, are relatively new skills found on a TV or film set. What are the new skills found on a Zoom, SRT, NDI-based production? Are there is there agreement on any new functions? And if so, are any new trainings required? Yeah, go ahead, George. So I'm, I'm just going to take a piece of this. Um, so... My last couple of jobs I've done over the past couple of weeks is uh, focus around Epiphone pearls, right? So we're taking, the last one was eight pearls equals eight rooms, eight SRT streams going to a relay in the cloud and then pushing down to our RTMP endpoints. So beyond that is the setup part of it. We have to set it up, set up the SRT feed, set up the record feeds. So definitely, I think there's room for us to really create some some new um categories uh, per se, you know, DIT and so forth. So I wouldn't say there's any training really needed. It's really a mixture right now. If you're already a video engineer or a video person, you could get it, but I think we could definitely create a few new categories on what we've done over the past three years and what we're doing now. Because while we're back in, in person, we're still doing stuff in the cloud, you know, because like I said, we're pushing on a regular basis now from venue to to the cloud to different endpoints. So I think there's definitely room for categories for some new names or new positions. Go Jeff. I couldn't even guess what the names will end up being, but SRT technician, someone that really understands SRT, you do need training. I, I feel like that there's, there's so many variables in there that can be changed, not just the latency, but there's a lot of different ways to do SRT. It's, it's just a container in the end. But I feel like that we definitely need more training in the, in the industry to bring people up because I get things and they're like, oh, I'm just sending you SRT. I'm like, okay, well, what exactly? And we have to get down to the nitty gritty of it. And there's not enough training and not enough common knowledge like there is with a lot of other things. I mean, Zoom, for instance, there's a lot of common knowledge there, thankfully to this group, but a lot of it. Uh, but I feel like the SRT side uh, could very well use a lot more knowledge. Don't even get me started on NDI needing knowledge. There's a lot of people that just don't understand it because they assume all NDI is the same. And it, again, it's not. There's NDI, there's NDI HX, HX3, and there's different ways to handle that on both on-prem and also in the cloud uh, scenarios. Go ahead, Jonas. I think we'll end up with a network engineer role who is specific to broadcast. One of the things that I keep finding is Broadcast and production runs a little different than like most day-to-day -day operations because we have like, yeah, one hour outage within a year is fine for most people. Like if you run an office network, a one hour outage during a live stream, not really a thing. So we have all these different processes that are reliant on, it's fine if it fails like 90% of the time, as long as it stays for those three hours that we're live, it stays on. So there's a totally different mindset of like, hey, we need to keep the ship running for two hours. And those two hours, they need to be guaranteed. And it's not like, oh, yeah, if it's down for an hour, we'll call a technician. He comes in in three hours. So I think networking is going to be like a huge challenge. And then like Jeff said, actually like more um, knowledge of codex and like what's actually in the packets, like how often do I, like Jeff, get told, hey, we're sending you an SRT feed? I'm like, great, what are you sending? OSC over SRT? Like, is it TS over SRT? What are you sending? And I think that's going to need to come in more and more. And hopefully vendors are going to start to pick up like the right way to talk about things like that and bring up that knowledge. Because right now it's, yeah, SRT, and then it's yeah. not compatible and then everybody's confused. You got it, George. So I, I agree with Jeff. Uh, the person I was just working with, uh, Muki, who worked on the back end for the last J Japan Olympics, and he really started to hurt my brain a couple of days ago with because he started to explain to me what Dante really is and how you have to know clocks and know how to match it with SRT and really break. He started to break it down for me, man. I, I did not know that you really need to really understand Dante on a larger scape and SRT and being able to get your video down to a real science. So definitely, I think there's some education to be had. 
Yeah, I mean, especially when you start doing network, <laughs> uh, network audio or video, um, you you just there's just a thousand things that that's why that, that's why broadcasters go well. We'll just use Maddie <laughs> because then they don't have to think about a lot of those things as they as they start moving audio around. Um, but uh, yeah, I think a lot of times what we try to do is also focus on um, devices that we can control remotely so that we don't have to put a core expert on the ground for every show. You know, so we need somebody who understands the networking and can get things done. But as soon as the everything lights up. I want to be able to have somebody else remote in and, and do the work that needs to be done oftentimes, um, you know, because it's it's just a lot more scalable. Go ahead, Courtney. And as far as uh, on uh, television production or film production, uh, this job, uh, DIT and, and data manager, has been is a moving target between different locals. If it's a union shoot, uh, Local 600 has tried to claim it for a digital imaging technician, of course. They're, they're adjusting and storing the image and making adjustments to on set monitoring for the DP. That is a Local 600 job. Local 695, which is the sound and video technicians local, uh, is claiming jurisdiction over data management because we have control over uh, use of computers on the set and workstations. That is in their charter. So there's an argument over that, but go to, if you are getting into the union or in either of those unions, look to those unions because they do have uh, new educational courses on data management and how to manage the data that's coming out of the camera and prepare it for sending to editorial, whether you're going camera to cloud, whether you're having to distribute it or go to a post-production facility to the editorial uh, via hard drives, et cetera. Managing that data is very important because they want to make sure they have multiple backups before they return the media, which is reusable to the camera and sound department to be used again. And if you overwrite something of the production that day, that can be a catastrophic mistake. Uh, and most of them, there's special software designed for data management on set uh, for doing those tasks uh, that uh, you know prepares uh, transcodes, prepares uh, uh, projects for delivery to different people, uh, for you know, executives to view at home and to editorial for them to edit with, et cetera. So uh, check into your local union if you're in a union that handles that 600 or 695. Does 695 handle those things? Oh, is that is that where that sits? Well, there's a lot of <laughs> grievances that <laughs> been filed over that. There's debate. Uh, they, they, I, I, I don't know where it goes back and forth and I don't know where we stand now. You can't, 695 can do data management, uh, imaging stuff. Digital imaging is, is local 600, which is the cinematographers guild. Right. Uh, they handle that generally, but for a long time, did, there was no classification for DIT in either one of those locals. So it was right. kind of a toss up to freelance people. And I think that a lot of um, DITs came from uh, 600. So I think that might be part of the part of the situation is that they were camera operators. I know a lot of the, the DITs that I know in Northern California are, you know, former or are 600 and then ended up in local 16 or whatever, but but are, are generally are stepping on both both areas. Go ahead, Jeff. I just want to say thank you, Courtney, for reminding me why I like living in Texas and how different it is and why I don't want to be around the film and TV Local industry. 600 covers Texas too, you know. <laughs> oh, you guys, man, you make it so complicated. Randy does the video stuff. He was just get Randy. He copies it all. <laughs> all right, next question. Next question comes to us from Tlaloc Lopez Waterman in Salisbury, Maryland. And Tlaloc this time says, Alex, your appearance on this week's MacBreak Weekly looked great. Was that your Sony camera with available lighting? Uh, it was pretty much my Sony camera with available lighting. So I, I have to admit, I've gotten pretty addicted to the Sony camera. Um, and so I was like, oh, I could take a webcam. But I was like, but I could just take put the Sony in the, in the it always makes it more stressful the day I come back. Like today, I was like, I, I, I get up, I'm looking through the questions. And I was like, I look up and there's no camera. I was like, oh, I gotta set the camera up again. So anyway, but... Um, uh, yeah. So what happened was I was at a I was at a, a facility um, that had a and so I I found a, a, a one of the the edit room um, had a open window so I was able to open the window up and uh, and then I do I do carry the little six C's the you know the nano light the nan light uh, six pavo pavo tubes and the the desk that the, the there was a four four me sitting on the desk but the, the desk is metal and so they just you just stick them on there and they just snap to them snap to the desk and so. 
Um, so I have a little bit of fill coming from two um, Pavo tubes. And then otherwise, it's a giant window. Like it, the window is, you know, six feet high and six feet wide. And it was looking out like I, the, it, was a, it was a nice scene. It was a scene of the Holland, Hollywood Hills <laughs> you know, was there, that was there. Uh, it was, it was a, a respite of like a, a couple 18 hour days <laughs> so, so that I was down there. So I couldn't really even get out of the facility other than to jump into Mac break from there. So that's, that's what that, that was there. Uh, next question. Uh, Funsak Dorji of Dar Amshala, India says, greetings. How much would it cost to use AWS Elemental to stream at 1080p60 for one hour? Can AWS Elemental boxes be used as a regular encoder to stream to YouTube and or Facebook? I go ahead, Jonas. So kind of. The boxes are only uplinks to AWS, and then you can stream from AWS on. Pricing-wise, this is where it gets a little complicated. Um, you will pay about 30 cents per hour on the output on an up to 10 Mbit 30 to 60 FPS HD stream that is uh, standard quality, which means um, AWS has some enhancements you can do on the codec, but you don't need that generally if you don't know about it. And then an AVC output, not an HEVC. And this is a single pipeline, so there's no redundancy in this. Um, that's 80 cents per output. And then on the input, you are paying for one active hour a month, which is at 75 cents around that. It depends on your data center and your region. And then the fun part starts, uh, then they also want one cent per hour that you don't use the input. Um, so that comes out to an, around $7.29. So uh, the stream one hour a month with your elemental link to YouTube. It's eight dollars and eighty-five cents, approximately. That is for Frankfurt. Your mileage might vary depending on which region you use. Um, yeah, it's. But pricing. If you think AWS pricing is complicated, have a look at Media Life. It's one of the like most complicated pricings. And one click of a button, you use like a standard pipeline, which is redundant instead of a single pipeline. And suddenly your cost is way higher. You use enhanced video because you think, oh, I don't want standard definition. And your cost is way higher. Um, it's a bit crazy. Next question. Next one comes to us from Tony Mobley. And Tony says, what is PL when talking about comms? I'll go ahead, uh, Courtney. Well, it depends because it's been used in a variety of different situations. PL usually stands for private line. And in comms, uh, that would be interpreted as uh, one microphone to one listener on the comms system. Uh, there's broadcast where one person can talk to everybody that's listening uh, on comms. And then there's PL, which is a single channel, point-to-point uh, -point private line. Uh, generally, so PL generally means private line, but a lot of people just use the term PL to mean in-ear monitor or something like that, you know, so it's kind of generic term now. Go ahead, Jeff. I must be a regional difference because in my world, uh, PL is party line. Yeah, yeah, the party uh, line, like, private line. Like I say, there's a lot of confusion well, about. Well, the, yeah. they're very, yeah, they're a little. Those are little, two different, way, way far apart, though. Party line means you got a lot of people on it, like the old, old school. Yeah, I, I actually have a photo phones. for you. <laughs> like, if you look at this, this is from my grandparents' um, uh, their house. They never took it out, and so um, if we pull this, let me pull this over here. Uh, and if, if you look at this, this is one of those turn phones where you actually turn it to to charge it up. But if you if you read this. It says, when making a phone call, if the line is not in use, replace the handset on the on the hook and give one short ring with the bell crank. When you have um, uh, when you have completed your con conversation, hang up the handset on the hook and signal to the operator disconnect this by giving one short ring. Um, and and these are the rural line. This is rural line, but this is the original party line. Like <laughs> this is the you are on a line that everyone is sharing, and you are telling the operator that I'm going to talk. Um, but that was the original party line, um, and uh, the um, and you could tell you know all the all the little bits and pieces. And so that that's where party line came from, um, and it is a uh, um, uh, it's it's we just took it and put it into production. Go ahead, Bill. 
Yeah, in the old days, when they were setting up the phone system, they would string a cable to a house. Then they would just go from that house to the next house to the next house to the next house. So whatever energized the line, whatever signals, everybody could listen to. And that was the party line. And that's why you had to have these codes to signal usually to the operator back at the central control. I once had a fun video that I had to do based on how this old system worked. And so uh, to me, a party line generally indicates a lot of people are on there. And in the new comm system, what you want to do is be able to group those into things like this is a PL for this group over here. This is another one over here. There's another one over here. So maybe a video group or sound group or something. And then the director can reach out to those groups and or do a let's talk to everybody to get everybody on the same page going in the same direction. Next question. Next question comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. What is an on-air sign that most simply will link to a stream deck? Low cost, easy to use, or important? Go ahead, Jeffrey. So uh, on-air signs are just basically light turn on, light turn off type signs. Uh, so there's a lot of them out there, and some of them have remote controls. Some of them don't. But nothing, nothing that I've ever I've seen that has actual Wi-Fi control over it. So to do this, uh, uh, you'd either have to build your own at this point, or you'd do some simple things like, for instance, you could get one of those plugs that uh, that connects up to your Wi-Fi, and then you can control. Uh, some of them do have native to the Stream Deck, and uh, some of these uh, systems, you'll have to do something like set up an IFTTT to get it to work with the uh, with the Stream Deck to go from there. Um, the you could get the Elgato lights and put them up behind you, and then just have an on air made uh, with that uh, overlay, and then uh, and then put that down. There's many different places you can go to just to get the on air uh, overlay sign, which would work really well. Govi had, and a couple of these other LED light uh, manufacturers have these things called neon LED strips which you can then mold into an on-air sign. And then finally, there's uh, some LED panels, like for instance, uh, Pixu is, is a name uh, that's coming to my head uh, right now. And uh, you can actually create uh, through there. Um, there is some Stream Deck integration, but once again, you'll probably use something like an IFTTT or uh, use the uh, Stream Deck API to actually build the button to turn it on and off. Go, Jonas. So the easiest thing is you go on Amazon, you buy one of these LED sends that is powered by an LED strip. Then you go to the Elgato website and you buy one of the Elgato key light strips. And then you automatically have your integration. You can make it all kinds of colors, maybe like green, like I'm live, I'm kind of live, but you can come in if there's something important to like red. I'm really, really live. I'm talking right now to whatever other colors you want, then that would have a really great uh, Stream Deck integration natively. Go ahead, Chris. Um, if you're using Companion, uh, I'm not sure about the actual Stream Deck software, but Companion has <clears throat> a TP-Link module. And so you can just buy one of the generic on-air light signs. It just plugs into power, plug it into the TP-Link, um, get one of the TP-Link uh, you know, Wi-Fi smart outlets, and that loads into Companion. And then you once you're in Companion, you can turn things on and off. Go, Jeff. I actually had this right next to me because I haven't put it up yet, but it's a an invest I did uh, one of those things. It's called the Busy Light, but it has all these different things that you can change off. So everything from on air to recording to on the phone or whatever, and you could print something as specific if you wanted it. And uh, it, they weren't much, like fifty dollars, I think, or something like that. Uh, they're battery controlled, and they do have an app coming for the Stream Deck. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's out yet, but I remember seeing some press about it. Uh, our How simplest, do you control it now? Uh, currently, right now, it it actually links off of Wi-Fi, uh, I believe, on this one. I, I, they, ha they have two different models. I, this one might be the dummy one, but I bought another one too, but I haven't seen it yet. Uh, but it, it's pretty cool little light. Um, I have the uh, what is it? The uh, this guy, the the little puck that links up to my zooms. Also, uh, as you notice, it's not plugged in because it doesn't always work. But it depends on if you want on air for a true on air like studio, or do you just want on air that I'm on the phone or I'm on on Zoom? There's a lot of different options out there now. Uh, and in uh, Kuwando uh, is uh, a, a different. Uh, 
uh, integration that uh, they're using with the busy light and and you they've got multiple different lights that are kind of different things but this this is uh this is definitely something new to the industry but on air like old school whenever we were in the radio when i was in the radio it was a switch <laughs> so it was a double switch because whenever i turned the mic on at the same time it energized a relay which turned on the actual lamp itself and the, but the lamp didn't say anything it was just a red light and you knew if it was a red light don't come in good bill and if you want to go old school big time the marker tech catalog and some of the other catalogs have a lot of traditional on-air lights that are molded and have switching capabilities and remote controls so you can spend a few hundred dollars and get a big one that like you see those in a couple of the people who are on the air for us next question Douglas Carmichael is up next. John, you mentioned that the AI industry is working on LLMs that can run on a phone. Would an LLM be engineered to adhere to the App Store review guidelines for safety and or decency? Go ahead, John. This is a very smart question, Douglas. No, they're not going to let these open, these open source LLMs run on the Apple devices. Note that Apple's been including these neural processors for a long time in, in silicon. And this is the specific reason why you're going to see, and I hope to see something at WWC next month, that they finally implement some code base on the, to use these neural networks that they've been including on the chips. But they won't let these open source stuff go into the, into the App Store. Maybe sideload. I got it, Courtney. Yeah, a question for John is, is I've only looked briefly into how all these uh, large language models work. Is the compute power and the uh, neural network processor required for the training or for the answering uh, using once once the model is trained and you generate all the statistical data does that take all the computing power or does it take that to decode it uh, once you ask it a question once you have a trained model and yeah. and oh, and an additional question is are the filters that filter out you know obscene material etc uh, does that happen on the training side or does that happen happen on the response side this is a second hour question. <laughs> uh, all, all of the above. And so the NVIDIA cards that are selling right now are the A100s and the H100s, super expensive. H100 is $30,000 for that one card. So on the processing side, on the training side, you've got people building these large language models. And on the processing side and the scalability, because of the amount of users that are uh, that are hitting that, doing the queries, that's where the processing power is needed. So it looks like there's a combination of of cloud and then and then uh, on the edge inside the in, these neural processors inside of the inside of the CPUs and these neural networks that they've been building into the, uh, the Apple silicon. And John, is there anything that you can just be converse? Is there any of these um, solutions that you can just be conversational with your phone? You know, like just sit there and do what you do with Chat GPT, but just ask the phone and have it read it back to you. Is that is that out there? Yeah, people have implemented those already. Um, and, are, and are they using ChatGPT generally? So just a yeah. voice execution. Now these are apps, right? For the for the the phones that you yeah, can they've got talk it. to the the Bing app for the for the phone. I, I think we'll do this right now. But I've seen a lot of third party implementations of this already done. Yeah, yeah very good. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. All users will eventually be required to pick a new unique username to use Discord. Because they will be unique to each user, new usernames will make it easier to identify and connect with your friends. Discuss. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, so basically what's happening is here is that uh, the names, if you've ever been on Discord and used those names, they're just kind of crazy. Like for instance, my name's uh, Jeffrey Powers, and then that's followed by a number. Yet somebody could also have Jeffrey Powers and the exact same number right behind it. Maybe uh, maybe they'll have a space in their name. And maybe they'll be using uppercase letters. Maybe they'll be using lowercase numbers or letters, excuse me. Uh, so what they're going to do is they're doing the address symbol or the at sign, however you call it, uh, just like with Twitter does, just like YouTube just did, Facebook, all, all these others to uh, pretty, pretty much put in, in a conformity approach. And... Uh, so if I get Jeffrey Powers, nobody else can have Jeffrey Powers. They might have Jeffrey Powers 01 or 37296 or whatever. Uh, but my my username will be my username. I think it's a great idea in this ever-expanding uh, Discord environment, especially when you can uh, call up a server, kill a server as just as easily, and uh, they just need to keep their database in check so everything just doesn't 
mess up one day and then next thing you know, we can't use Discord. Go ahead, Jonas. It's the same thing that YouTube is doing. They're rolling out uh, unique usernames, but there's still going to be a display name and there's still going to be um, nicknames. So you can choose a username that works for you. And the main thing that they're doing is they're dropping the um, identifier after your name with the numbers because that one always had to be unique with the key of your name. Um, that's a basic what is happening and they're rolling it out the same way that YouTube did. So the longer you've been on Discord, the earlier you get to choose your username. So they're rolling it out from the back. Yeah. Next question. Next one comes to us from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. And he says, is it possible to use an Apple Watch and AirPods only to listen to office hours while walking? Go ahead, Bill. I don't believe so. And here's why. There's no streaming app that I have run across that works on watch OS. Most of the content I listen to while I'm walking comes from services like Audible, and it requires downloading into the watch so that it's local. Even if you have uh, one of the watches that has um, Wi-Fi or wireless connection, cellular connection, I haven't found a streaming app to load into watch OS yet. If there's one out there, I don't know about it. All right. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I had a little bit of a technical problem on my end. <laughs> we are now jumping into uh, jumping into the second hour here, and we're really, really excited to have Epifan here. Um, finally, uh, we a lot of us here are using a variety of Epifan tools, and uh, we have Dan Wallace and uh, Julian Fernandez here, as well as Zoom's Andy Carluccio. Of course, there's been a big. Uh, uh, shift in what is available with Zoom and Epifan. And I'm going to let Dan actually kind of give us an intro to exactly uh, what the changes are. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having us. It's really a thrill to be a part of Office Hours. We've we've been fans of what everyone here is doing for quite some time. And in fact, uh, inside Epifan, we've had a lot of conversations and this show has inspired us quite a bit. So I appreciate uh, our opportunity to be here. Thanks, Alex. Really, really uh, great to have so, you. Absolutely. Uh, so yesterday we just announced the launch of Epifan Connect for Zoom. And, uh, you know, uh, people are thrilled that this tool is now available. Uh, I think probably the best way to describe it, and I might kick it over to my colleague, uh, Julian Fernandez, but uh, I'll share a little bit of a demo. Maybe I'll just kick it to Julian now to, to sure. share some of the details. So, uh, so I'm Julian. I'm kind of the, uh, I guess I'll call myself the talking guy for today from Epifan. Uh, come my role, I run our uh, product marketing team. So I've spent uh, probably the last year, the last year and a half since I've been at Epifan, uh, talking with hundreds of different folks. You know, many of whom either watched the show or you know, folks like I see, you know, Jeff Powers that are on the show and Jonas and others as we've kind of been building this. Uh, tool set. And if you visited us at NAB or Infocom or some of our, you know latest live shows and webinars, you'll probably have seen something, you know, saying broadcast without barriers. You know, that's who we are at Epifan. And that's that's kind of been our North Star uh, for who we are and supporting folks like all of you on this call to just deliver higher quality video. And, and we like to think of ourselves as doing that in two ways. The first one is we want to help you make every space into a studio. And we think connect uh, with both Zoom that we're announcing now and, you know, how we've had it with Microsoft for a while now really allows you to do that because now your studio can be like we're all right now sitting on a zoom call you can join from anywhere it can be if you're working with a client that installed a bunch of zoom or teams rooms folks can go right into that zoom room that uh was my background previously that they've paid an av integrator to put in and, and get really great video out of there to contribute and, and the other bit is kind of the other half of our tool so we kind of say we want to help you make every video an experience and that's where we look at things like Perl, tools like Unify, like Dan's going to walk us through today, that you can take those uh, ingest points, whether they're Zoom, whether they're another encoder, whether it's a physical camera plugged into that Perl, and you're going to be able to you know, create these great layouts and really produce a show using this tool set. And we see these all these parts as kind of uh, real building blocks in a tool set that we enable folks like all these media practitioners on the call and then that are listening and watching today to really build a workflow that works for you. Because I, I don't want to come in and, you know, Dan and I are going to show you what it looks like to do the workflow in our tooling. But hey, if you have a production tool that you love today, whether you're a Vmix guy, whether you're using, you know, Grass Valley Suite or anything else, cool. You can replace our production tool with that one and use Connect to feed Zoom folks in as sources. And, and that's really what we want to do is we want to keep continuing to empower you guys to deliver that best quality video and make every video an experience using these building blocks 
And the fun part, as you'll see what Dan's doing, is it's all cloud power. So you're able to connect and manage your pearls literally from anywhere. Uh, uh, one of the fun things Dan's going to take us through how he did that show at NAB with Andy and Nick and uh, Steve Vonderhaar from uh, Futurum Group. And he was in Ottawa in his house. We didn't want to make him come into the office at, I think it would have been like 2 a.m. Or, or sorry, until 9 p.m. The 2 a.m. one would have been Barcelona at ISE. So he, he sat in his, in his office at home and he ran a remote studio from across the continent and across the world completely in, in our cloud tool set. And that's, that's really the power of this building block approach that you can choose what you need to make your show work and it all works together seamlessly. So you can be anywhere and make it happen. So I'm gonna let Dan, rather than talking too much, I'm gonna let Dan take us through how he does it. And hopefully that'll uh, inspire some questions uh, from you guys. So we can keep the conversation going in the second hour. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, thank you. Uh, why don't we switch? I've got a, an over the shoulder camera. If we can switch to that, I can kind of show you what I see a little bit here and uh, uh, walk you through my workflow that we used for our NAB production suite. So uh, you'll see the Dan OTS camera, there we go. So over here on the left, I've got my Zoom call. Here in the center, I've got my Epifan Connect dashboard. And over here on the right is my switching tool uh, with Epifan Unify, but this could be any switcher that you prefer to use. Uh, but here in the center, I can see I've, I've uh, already paired our Office Hours Theater Zoom meeting with the Epifan Connect tool. So when I go into this tool and I believe I can screen share. I was told. Uh, yeah, so be shared. To. Yeah. Okay. Let me just get that up. Okay, and uh, there we go. Let me know when you have it. Looks like it's up. So I can see all the sources in this Zoom meeting, and I can extract them to my production suite, to my production tool. So why don't we start with? Uh, I don't know. We'll grab uh, Bill. I'm just going to click start. And you've got a couple options here. First of all, you've got a manual SRT mode, and this allows you to sort of customize an SRT extraction to go wherever you want it to go. And you've got some options like video quality. You can choose your bit rate, your frame rate. You can so standardize. I, so if I'm understanding this correctly, you you are you're in the sh you're in the show and you're basically able to grab onto someone and say, OK, now I just want to send so this out as an SRT feed. Is that is that correct? within the cloud yes. and, it can be, and it can be going to somewhere else in the cloud or it could be going to another epifan device so, or another srt device exactly, exactly. you just so you describe so it exactly yes. yeah so what we're doing here is our cloud service is actually talking to the cloud back end of the zoom meeting and is right. pulling the raw feeds from that side so there's no kind of edge device involved we're just purely seeing in the cloud and you'll see dan as dan's setting it up now with the manual srt mode we're just going to give you an srt caller a listener url hand it over to the other half to your production tool and press start. And you're sending an SRT feed either down to you know physical production hardware or to another cloud service. And one of the cool things with the video quality here is that selector that Dan's showing where you can go full HD, which is a 1080p 30, a 720p 30 or custom where you can vary the bit rate as well as the frame size and uh, go up to 60 FPS. We're actually going to Connect will scale it to maintain a consistent frame size so that if you know the other folks on the other end, they don't have a great connection into the Zoom meeting and, or the Microsoft Teams meeting because Teams works the same way and you see the frame size vary, we'll stabilize it so your production tool is, is getting a consistent 1080 feed or 720 feed. So you don't have to worry about, you know, when you're seeing someone's ISO coming in and getting bigger and smaller as the USB tool and, varies. And is there any limit to the number of outputs or the number of participants that you can grab onto from the, from the feeds? So right now, each instance, so it's a dedicated VM that joins the meeting, can extract five uh, 1080p SRT feeds out of the meeting. So you can choose any five participants. You can change them as you're going. If you've got a larger group like we have here on Office Hours on the stage, uh, you're able to put multiple instances of Connect into the same right. meeting, and each one can extract five. So you know, for, for one of our bigger yeah. productions we did at the launch, I think, Dan, what do we have, like nine guests? plus call in people. So I think we were shuffling 12 uh, inputs around. We had a, you know, main panel bot. We had a, you know, guest QA people bot. And then we had the third one for the live callers that I was managing and turning folks on and off. And since it's in the cloud service, uh, we can all be looking at the same uh, dashboard right now. Like I, I have it up on my screen as well. I can see everything Dan's doing live and I can jump in and say, Dan, you know, message me in the back or on the comms channel says, hey, you know what, we got to extract Andy right away. 
I can start that up at the same time he is. That's great. Yeah. One of the other advantages is if you are using Perl hardware, like here, here's a little Perl mini here. And this is what we used in our micro studio at NAB. Um, you can pair your extraction source directly to your, your Epifan hardware. Uh, and if I just click this Epifan tab, I can see all the pearls that I have in my, in my edge network. And I can just uh, directly pair my zoom sources and extract those ISOs right into my Perl device. I also have um, a cloud instance called Unify, and that's like our cloud switching tool at Epifan. So I can choose a, uh, it's almost like a cloud Perl, and I can choose a cloud instance to extract to. So why don't I extract uh, Bill right now? I've got my input set up in my switcher. We're going to put Bill in the host chair, and I just click start, and right away it's going to connect. I'm going to get some information about the extraction. So it's going to let me know what frame size I'm extracting. Basically, it'll show me what I'm receiving from Zoom, and then it'll show what I'm sending via SRT into my tool. And if we can go back to my over the shoulder camera, you'll see now I've already got Bill in my switcher over here on the right. You can kind of see him right here. Why don't I also grab, uh, oh, we'll grab Alex as well. We'll put you into our guest one chair. And I think I see Jeffrey. Jeffrey, we're going to grab you as well. You'll see how quick this is. We'll put Jeffrey into my third slot. And just like that, in a matter of moments, I've extracted ISOs right out of Zoom. They're in my switching tool. This could be Epifan. This could be any switching tool you prefer. And, and this uh, is in the cloud. That switching tool is in the cloud. Exactly. Our, our, our Epifan unit, we call it Epifan Unify. It's in the cloud. Uh, so this is a cloud to cloud extraction, which means, oh, well, first of all, there's a lot of redundancy in that. Uh, you've got extremely low latency. I think I'm extracting these sources at 80 milliseconds. So super quick. And then if I refresh this, I'm just doing a little test stream to YouTube. You can see in my center screen there, I have my, uh, my three source extractions and, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really that straightforward, a few clicks. And, uh, this is something that's easy enough for anyone to use really. Oh, that's, that's really cool. And, and the, uh, and for with your devices that do the outputs, what are the maximum number of channels that can come out of your hardware on the on-prem? Is there, is so, there, are they mostly single channel or are there more? So on, on for the edge devices, we have kind of, kind of three and we'll kind of break them to two quick categories. The Pearl Nano is a single channel encoder, does not switch. So it's really, you know, we see folks, if you're a vMix op, you might output your vMix into the, into the HDMI input of the Nano that Dan's holding and use that just to do your final encode. Cause it's, it's a single channel, but it can stream to multiple destinations on that channel. So if you have... You know, hey, we got to go live on LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube and our Crowdcast CDN like we often do at Epifan. Cool, we can output into the Nano and that'll send it to those four spots of a single channel. The Pearl Mini that Dan was holding before, that's the one with the touchscreen on the front. That's kind of our, our real uh, workhorse, most popular device because it's portable. You can switch on the touchscreen. You can configure the whole thing from the touchscreen. That will do two channels. So you can have two independent programs going and switched on there. And then the Pearl 2 will let you do up to six. And the, the Pearl 2 versus the Mini, the feature set's very similar. They allow that switching. Um, Pearl 2 does add chroma keying and just more horsepower, so you can be doing more at once on the device because we do, uh, yeah, what well, we do a lot in software on the devices themselves. So the, that bigger processor, larger box lets you do a lot yeah. more than the Mini would. But that, I'll, just, I'll just add, with something like a Pearl 2, you could run a full show on, on a Pearl 2. Um, and, and we do that all the time. Um, you can do switching, you can record your ISOs. It's got a hard drive built in. You can pair it with, um, some network storage as well to make it really easy to grab your ISO recordings. So, uh, really what's, what I find great is like, you can kind of use these building blocks to create the production workflow that works for you. And we're not at Epifan. We're, you know, we're, we're all about universality. You know, we, we understand that many people have a production workflow that already works for them and we're not looking to entirely replace it. Take the pieces you need and, and you can optimize what, what your workflow looks like. That's great. We've got a lot of questions uh, stacking up, but we're going to go ahead and in the panel, if you uh, raise your hand in the panel, if you want to ask a couple of questions before we get to the producer questions, uh, George, what do you got? Good morning, Dan Julian. So obviously our heads are spinning right now. So I'm thinking we're in the cloud, but 
if we wanted to bring down a guest, um, I know the pearls only do one way right now. Can you see us de- being able to decode that that information to put out to a projection system or to a hardware switcher on premises? So the pearls will decode the SRT feed, and you can feed it right out via the, the HDMI output on it into a hardware switch. We're we're working with a few folks. Actually, we have a. Uh, a government agency in California that's doing exactly that to bring in remote guests uh, for their uh, it's a you know panel of commissioners and they have remote callers calling in to ask the commissioners questions or one of the commissioners you know is ill and can't can't be there that day they're bringing them in remotely and they're actually looping uh, the the folks out of uh, well, connect into the Pearl taking that channel out it's Pearl two so they've got the two HDMI outs taking that person out putting them in the restaurant switcher and then that's what lets them uh, show the person on on a screen next to the panel where they, if they're not able to be in their chair. How are we handling yeah, audio on that output? Uh, so the, the audio is coming into the Pearl so that it's, so when we're pulling from zoom, it's in ISO. So video and video and audio together. And then you can on the Pearl select, if you want the audio to come out of the Pearl with the video or uh, probably feed out into uh, your switch there and have to break it outside the Pearl. That's great. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the producer questions. If you've got questions, go ahead and throw those into McConnell right now. The first one comes from Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona. And Jack asks, can you show how you can send the stream to multiple destinations with multiple channel brands? For example, when you're doing a collaboration with another YouTube channel. Sure. So that's probably happening on a Pearl or on the Unify side, because that's the, the production tool that's creating the final output. Connect, as we said earlier on, is kind of, it's that capture tool. Yeah. It's just getting I, a raw feed out of, te- out of Teams or Zoom and putting it in your switch. So Dan will take I, us I can that. show. I can show a little more. I'll, I'm going to jump into Unify on my screen share here, and maybe I can uh, kind of show that a little more directly. Um, so, so what's here happening here in, is you have, you, you have the Connect, and that's going, that's going to grabbing onto your any of the zoom channels and then sending them out as srt or sending them to another device um and then then to get it to youtube you would need to use the unify right so that you you're going to send well, it out unify pearl vmix right 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 mm-hmm. whatever your production tool is that's where that final mix and stream is going to happen from connect is yeah. just it's an ingest tool it's turning all of us into independent feeds that we can put into whatever production tool you want to use in our Unify switching tool, you can set up as many streaming destinations via RTMP uh, that you want. So right now I'm streaming to one YouTube channel, but you could very easily send it to uh, several YouTube channels. Or if you have other CDNs, you know, send that RTMP as, as many as you need that. And because it's in the cloud, you know, you're not you're not bandwidth capped. Right. So you can really send some high quality uh, RTMP outputs wherever you need them to go. It's great. We'll stream yeah. SRT as well out of out of Unified. It's you know, kind of like the same yeah. choice you'd have on yeah. Pearl. So we, you we can do, do a support... mix of SRT, RTMP, and HLS yeah. dash out of it. Yeah, I was just going to add that you know we have a lot of streaming protocols that we support. Uh, RTMP, obviously, but uh, MPEG dash. Uh, we we also support H two six five encoding. So if your CDN can support H two six five, you can you can use that as well. Next question. Next one comes to us from Georgie Kennedy in Washington, D.C. Are there many variations of pearls and which are best suited for multi-channel pips and switching? I think we touched on this a little bit earlier. I think for, for those three things, multi-channel pips and switching, you're going to be looking at a Pearl Mini or a Pearl 2. Uh, the Pearl Mini is going to be able to do two channels with pips and switching. The Pearl 2 is going to do up to six. And if you're going bigger, like what you see with Dan here on the screen, we've got Unify that's kind of the, the cloud version of that software stack that's going to let you do all of that in the cloud if you're using remote sources. The Nano is that single channel real contribution encoder. So that is actually pairs amazingly well with Unify because you can have a fleet of com- remote managed hardware and you'd be sitting in your studio like one of our uh, customers does in Chicago and sending all those feeds right back. And if you want to do it all in the cloud into Unify or into uh, your production switcher there in, in your studio in Chicago, and you're just managing that nano from the desk there. All you need the on-site tech to do is connect an SDI or HDMI input and a network, and you're up and running, and it's a remote-controlled little contribution encoder. I've Next got, question. Uh, oh, if you look, go ahead. Go ahead. oh, I was just going to mention on the screen share, you can see I've got my fleet of pearls, and we've got a whole bunch of pearls 
in our cloud. So I can see all the devices at the edge, right? And I can route them into the cloud, out of the cloud, onto hardware, into the cloud switching tool. You've got a lot of options and a lot of flexibility here. Um, and we've created a dashboard that makes it really easy to set up the information that you want to see that matters to you. You can have some alerts. You can start and stop recording, start and stop streams on all of your devices and cloud instances from this one, one dashboard. That's really great. Uh, next question. Andy Kokendorfer is up next from Vieira, Florida. Does Epifan integrate with Panopto? So we have a direct uh, integration on the hardware side with the pearls. It's something that uh, if you look where Dan's at screen share, there's a button that says events. And if the pearls are paired there, so we see a lot of major universities are doing this or your largest customers are some, some folks like Middle Tennessee State or North Carolina State University. And the pearl will then have a, a scheduled recordings controlled through Panopto and you can feed right in there and, and have a, a really, really, really uh, simple kind of touchless experience. Uh, for record for our listeners can you explain a little bit what panopto is what their what their primary use is sure so panopto is is kind of a a cms service we see with with our integration the primary use case has been for for lecture capture by universities so they'll have you know middle tennessee state which is down the road for me uh, around COVID time they basically came in and said hey look every class has to be recorded and streamed so if the student's ill and can't come in they're going to get the same information uh off of their LMS, which is connected to Panopto and they can watch it. So the Pro Minis in every classroom there, if class starts at 11 a.m., they're gonna start streaming two feeds, one of content, one of a camera, and then students can access that either within Panopto or within their LMS to, to rewatch the video. And Panopto is just the, that big storage uh, land that that has a really, really slick way of getting all these videos organized for folks to watch. And we just create a very, very, very easy to use capture device at the edge that like we've been talking about, can be remotely managed. So you have one one person at a university managing three or 400 pearls uh, all from their desk. Got it. Um, next question. Pete Kirk in Ohio is up next. He says, how does it compare to Zoom ISO price and feature-wise? I'll go ahead, Andy. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we know what we're doing here. Um, yeah. First, let me say, you know, we're, we're super excited to be working with Epifan on Connect. Um, and it's, you know, one of those announcements that we had at NAB is that how we opened ZoomISO's core technology to developers uh, to be able to do the same sort of things that we're doing in ZoomISO, but do them in a way that makes sense from their perspective on the market, right? And so with Epifan, you're seeing this mesh of hardware and cloud workflows. You're seeing the connect for distribution. You're seeing Unify for cloud switching. And of course the pearls for these smart edge encoders as part of that ecosystem. Whereas Zoom ISO is more focused on being sort of a high performance on-prem decoder for Zoom to NDI and SDI and Siphon and physical displays and Dante and all of that stuff. So um, they're desi- by design, this ecosystem is designed to be side by side, right? And so the, the products are um, using the same core features so you have a consistent experience across solutions, which is really important to us to make sure you're still getting those high quality video feeds from Zoom directly, you know, into the ecosystem that you want to use. But when you're thinking about, you know, the form factor of production, if these cloud workflows and routing and things are important to you, uh, you can sort of rest assured that the technology that was used to build Zoom ISO is, is cropping up inside of Epifan's ecosystem. And so you can take advantage of what they offer there um, to be able to get that more flexible cloud routing experience, a remote switcher, things like that, more of an integrated um, unified experience on the Epifan side, where Zoom ISO is still there in case there's some product or app that doesn't support, you know, SRT or doesn't support Zoom, you know, natively. Now you can put that on an SDI output and plug that into, you know, your, your A10 mini and, and, and do a show there like that. So um, I'll let Epifan speak to the pricing component of it. But from a feature perspective, we're trying to build an ecosystem for production using these strong underlying core AV that Zoom can offer. Do you want to add to the specific, uh, what is the pricing and how does the pricing work? I guess is a sure. good question. So, yeah, like Andy said, I can talk to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got uh, being cloud service, as you can imagine, it's a little bit different model than uh, than Zoom ISO, like Andy said, where he's looking at being kind of that edge decode. So we actually spent a lot of time working on this price model and talking to hundreds of folks like yourselves as media practitioners. And we wanted to create something that was uh made sense for how your how a lot of your businesses work so we have kind of two models that work together so if you go in on our website right now uh, i will encourage you if you go to epifan.com connect you can put in your email and you'll actually get a code if you sign up to get your first month and five hours of use for free so you guys can all go in today after after office hours uh test it out for yourself see if it works and how that billing work after that, if you, if you like it and you want to stick with it is there's a 25 dollars monthly subscription fee for access to the service 
And then we're going to bill you $25 per hour of use that you use the service, that you're in a meeting and that you'll see, you know, Dan is sharing a screen, there's a little ticker and a timer for the meeting. Uh, we do give you 15 minutes of every meeting free. So right now, you know, this bot's been running for from close to 45 minutes. So your bill would say, hey, you know, on today during the office hour show, you ran for 37 minutes. You, you know, fraction that out, multiply it uh, by $25 an hour, and you'll get a bill at the end of the month uh, for what you've used. If you see this, you know, if you're a corporate user or you see this being a key part of your workflow, we do offer a reserved capacity model, similar to how you'd buy uh, online cloud storage from vendors that you, if you commit to a set number of hours up front for the year, uh, you prepay and, and you're going to get a pretty significant discount off the MSRP. So you might you end up paying $18 an hour because you've made a commitment up front for, for a block hours for the year. And that's for each, each instance, right? So if you put three instances, you're, you're running three of those? Yeah, you're, that's per, yeah. So the, the time is basically per instance used and, and it'll just total up at the end of the month, kind of like a cell phone bill. And then, hey, cool, I used... You know, 200 minutes this month, that was, you know, an hour and the th third, and we're going to multiply that by $25. And yeah, that makes sense. Bill. Excellent. Uh, next question. David Brady in New York City is up next. And David says, with your cloud production platform, can multiple directors, and he notes primary and backup, cut the same show? I can yes, field that one. Can. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Dennis. We're, we're both looking yeah. at the same thing right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, this is this is a great advantage of a cloud to cloud workflow, right? Is because you you can have redundancy in your people as well, right? So if God forbid my internet went down right now, Julian is on there, he can jump in and take over. Um, but it also means that you can have sort of director contributors in the tool as well. So you might have one person who's focused on switching, another person who's focused on streaming destinations you know, scale up your team as much as you need. It is possible to do all of this with one person. Uh, but if you want to have some, uh, some additional hands on, on the helm as, uh, so to speak, you can, you can certainly do that. Next question. Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona is up next. Does Epifan connect require Perl hardware or can you remote switch shows purely coming in from zoom? So connect does not require Perl hardware. It can talk to whatever production tool you'd like to use. The only uh, requirement to switch the show is that you're feeding it into a production tool. Because again, Connect is simply grabbing feeds from Zoom, turning them into SRT, and sending them into something else. So sure, I could broadcast my raw feed directly out from uh, from Connect into, you know, well, not a YouTube channel, but once they accept SRT, sure, you could do that. Uh, but you won't be able to switch to layouts, graphics, any of that. That's all going to come in your production tool, whether that's Perl, whether that's Unify, or whether that's whatever other one you're using today that you enjoy that, that speaks SRT. Next question. Next one comes from Jesse Mills in the San Francisco Bay Area. What type of Zoom account does one need to pull the five 1080p participants? Go ahead, Andy. Just like all of our production tools, the um, the resolution of the meeting will be handled by the host's account and not by the production tool itself. So in this example, um, where you want 1080p extractions, you're going to be looking usually at a business account, um, and then you've contacted and asked for the 1080p activation. You've turned on Group HD and Zoom.us web portal for the meeting settings, and you've set that to 1080p. Then any following the setting of that web portal setting, any meeting that that account hosts will be 1080p capable. And then when the production tool joins and requests, 1080p, the cloud to cloud transfer will be the 1080p raw data from Zoom going into this in this example, Epifan, and then that'll stream out at, at 1080 from there from the production tool. So it's um, it's that cloud to cloud transfer component that, you know, is um, going to be a function of what the meeting is capable of, right? Not the production tool itself. Now, as as Julian and Dan said before, if for whatever reason there's a contributor side limitation, uh, maybe their internet isn't so good or their webcam is 720p locked, um, there is that output standardization layer that sits inside of Connect between, you know, the Zoom low latency experience and the SRT standardized production experience that will repeat or drop frames as needed, scale the video up or down to make sure that it's always the target resolution and the target frame rate. Um, so in that sense of it, you know, you can rest assured that regardless of how the meeting is configured, those outputs will be, you know, exactly as you configured them. But when you think about what the source video feed is inside of the output, that's where you're going to want to look at the Zoom account level and see how that's configured. Um, so that's and, and of course, you can always push, you know, charts or things like that through as well. But what's nice about Connect is you can actually see 
the receiver side coming right in. And you can see that, yeah, this is what I'm getting from Zoom. And this is what I'm sending to the output. Super slick, super convenient. So you can, you know, you don't have to guess what Zoom is sending. You can see it right there in the app. That's great. Next question. Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina is up next. Is there an API or anything that gives Zoom OSC type control without having to have a Mac running Zoom OSC? So I guess the question there for 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 you, it, this is really just video. So it's you're not controlling Zoom, you're not um, working, you know, sending commands to it. You're just what what Epifan is doing is really focused on taking video feeds out of Zoom and delivering them to the cloud or to a hardware device. Is that is that a good assumption there? Uh, you are spot on, Alex. I don't think we need to <laughs> add much more. Yeah, we're totally. In the cloud, we're going to grab a video feed. We're going to stabilize it. We're going to send it somewhere else. That's that's all we we want to do with Connect. That's great. Not, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next, and Douglas says, "What is the value proposition for your product versus other cloud streaming solutions like Streamyard, Streamyard Studios, uh, streaming studios like Streamyard?" Sure. So I, th I think the big thing with Epifan, where we've always kind of sat, is kind of in this this nice niche spot between, you know, UC and, and Zoom and these basic tools like StreamYard that folks use, and that you know full on you know Grass Valley or TV production suite or even you know a vMix on the top end. Our our tools are going to give you the ability to do a higher quality production than a StreamYard with greater control and some more pro functionality, but at no point. Are we looking at you know vmix and saying hey we want unify we want pearl to be that we want it to be an accessible way for folks with you know what we shorthand internally as level two which is you know probably my level of uh, a skill and experience producing shows not like any of you that are that are on here and on this panel with us that i know a little bit about av i know how to connect cables i know the basics of switching and the basics of setting it up within within 30 minutes of getting my first pearl when i started up a fan I had multiple cameras connected and I was streaming a nice little show. So that that's really where we want our tool to sit. It's you can graduate from StreamYard into something mm -hmm. uh, like Connect Plus a Pearl or Connect Plus Unify to deliver that that next level. And I can add a little bit of color to that if I might. Uh, you know, the big advantage here over something like a StreamYard is is Zoom because uh, Zoom becomes. Uh, like your green room, it becomes that communication back channel that allows you to really create a great experience for your guests. And actually, I I got a plug the office hours episode from earlier in the week uh, about guest experience and, you know, creating that familiar connectivity for your guest for that first mile of your video is is crucial. And, and this is a great way to do that. Yeah. And, and I have to say that I we've done so many events now with zoom with breakout with the meetings and the breakout rooms and moving we talked about this what you're referring to on monday but moving our participants from one room to another that if you go to any other service that doesn't provide that it's like i i can't run a show here <laughs> just like, you know, like i can't i can't do this without having those things and so but what, what's really interesting is being able to take, you know, all of these now these Zoom ISO tools like Epifan and being able to just plug them into the room that is going to be the broadcast stage. And but there's this whole ecosystem that we build up around it um, that really does make a huge difference for the talent. Like it is it is night and day between anything else that we've seen is is just the breakout rooms and how they how you build that out. And it's probably worth another whole second hour just on managing breakout, managing shows with breakout rooms. But what's great is we d then come back to this, the, you know, something, whether it's a Zoom ISO or, or it's a Epifan cloud of just, this is our room and we know that we're broadcasting out of it. And I think that it's sometimes folks have a hard time getting their head around what that looks like, but it's, it's a very powerful production tool. Um, next, next question. Jack Cannon of Phoenix, Arizona, back again with the Pearl Mini has two HDMI inputs and one SDI input and two USB inputs. How many cameras can you run through these in total? So that's, uh, it's, you just add the inputs there. So it's five total physical cameras. We're also able to bring in two NDI HX, RTMP, or SRT sources as on the input side as well. Uh, and it's one of those things that just with the flexibility of our hardware, uh, you also want to look at how much other stuff you're doing on that Pearl because you're going to see, you know, usage load on the device start to go up the more things you try to do on a mini. So if you're, you're, you want eight inputs, you're probably better off with the Pearl 2 because it'll let you do more on the switching side. But if you're doing a fairly basic show, the mini can, you can take those, you know, five physical to virtual and, and turn it into a, a nicely switched program. 
And I can see like what, as you were talking is this, there's also, you know, especially when in a mixed environment where you have some people that are on site, some people that are um, going to be coming in from Zoom and you're trying to build a, an event that's going to look look like that, or you're going to even have just some, a handful of hardware folks. I mean, you know, you know individuals in their office, um, but other, you know, that, that you want to tie in having one interface that grabs all of that. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that we can cobble that together, you know, and make that work. Yeah. But you would have, you know, in this interface, and um, you might want to ex explain to me exactly how that would look, but you could have a, you could have both the hardware devices that are, that are contributing as well as the Zoom participants that are contributing. And then that, those are all being in a kind of a unified way. You can see all of them, deliver them all and hand them to a vMix or, or something else to cut the actual show. Is that, is that right? Yeah, so I'll let Dan walk us through that because that's actually what he was doing at NAB. We're, we're mixing Zoom sources, we're mixing Perl sources, and, and, and he was doing it all again from, from his house in Ottawa while we were all in Vegas. Right. Yeah, it, exactly. Like the great thing about these tools is that you can kind of mix and match your your hardware at your edge, your sources that are, you know, your your on premise with your virtual sources that are coming in over over Zoom. So the result is that you can very easily uh, execute on hybrid productions. So, you know, maybe you do have a studio with a couple cameras, throw down a Pearl Mini, uh, grab a couple guests. You know, we ran our NAB studio kind of like a call-in show where we were actually inviting guests to participate live. And we just put a URL on screen. Hey, join our Zoom call. Uh, and we had some guests joining us live in real time, which was really, really awesome. And it created that great interaction. So whether it's virtual, on-site or hybrid, we've we've got a way to make it all work together. When you put out the public call for action too, that's another <laughs> good time when it's, right, it's nice to have breakout rooms <laughs> so that people show yeah. up in one place, not yeah. in your main, uh, not in your main show, uh, rel you know, you have a place to manage that. You're, you're exactly right, Alex. But you know, you could use one room if you if you want to take that little bit of if we want to roll the dice. You know, you're only yeah, extracting the sources that you decide, right? Right, so right. You've got That's isolated true. That's true. audio with Connect. So yeah, yeah, if yeah. you did have someone jump on your call for whatever reason and start yapping, they're there. You can rest assured that they're not in your program, at least, but <laughs> definitely do recommend the breakout room. And that's exactly and what we did. Actually, we just had it's very similar to how you all ran this, run this show here at office hours. You've got a green room, you've got someone to yep. welcome your guest, get them prepped, you know, hair, makeup, lighting, audio. Okay. Ready. Throw them in the main room and, and you're ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I've, I've played the green room guy in a lot of these and it's been a lot of fun because Dan and I are communicating in the background. I'm, you know, messaging him or on comm saying, Hey, you know, it actually was fun because Steve Vonderhaar, who was on the show as a, you know, speaker presenter with, with us at NAB actually called in, was one of the random calling guests on our previous show that he hit the link. He came on and I see him like, Oh, I know Steve. I let him into their green room. Hey, he knows what he's doing. Camera's on, ready to go. I, message dan hey you've got steve coming over and dan is the producer because he's not being extracted just like our producers can hear spoke into the main call saying hey steve is coming in and then nick introduced him as the caller and he was able to participate in the panel there and it, it creates this really really nice handoff and again that that extraction bit lets us choose and, and control who's coming into that output feed so the producer can again use that that main stage like the green room and talk in and let everybody what, know what's happening. And what's the latency from, so the, there is, we're in a conversation in, in Zoom, so we're, you, you know, we're not going through the SRT, but what is the, the time between when the SRT is grabbed in Zoom and when it's delivered to vMix, let's say? Yeah, we're, we're I, I can speak to that. So we're very commonly using under 100 milliseconds of latency. So I've done shows where we're using 80 milliseconds latency, cloud to cloud. If you have more distance, you might want to increase your SRT latency a little bit. So when we're doing overseas stuff that's going over public internet, we might increase it to 125 milliseconds of latency. But you know, you, you, we are talking about extremely low latency here, so mm. it really makes it that much easier to, you know, connect your guests regardless of their location. One thing I can add on that is, you know, you might be familiar with thinking about SRT from an edge to edge experience. If you're if you use SRT most commonly to like beam a camera from one place and directly receive that on your network somewhere else, that's where those, you know, 200, 300, 1000 millisecond 
you know, familiarity with SRT is coming from when you're starting in the cloud, right? You have all your media routing in the cloud, and then you're leaving the cloud, the most proximate location to the place where you need to, you know, deliver out to. That's where these latencies start to come down, especially if we're talking completely within the cloud, right? We're going to go from cloud to cloud, service to service within there. You can really pull those SRT latencies down because you're, you're traversing, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure that's designed for that kind of traffic. Um, when you're going from point to point, you know, edge to edge, that's when you want those larger SRT buffers, right? And, and there is a stability there because being able to build your show in the cloud, you know, you're depending on when you, when we're bringing it back down, which we do currently, um, but but eventually we'll be in the cloud. And part of that advantage is, is that you're depending on the co connectivity of both ends, you know, and, and what that looks like when you're sending it up, that, that you can't really avoid, but when you're bringing it back down, how much can you do up there and, and keep that that going in, in that low latency bubble? Uh, next that's, question. That's, that's oh, a big reason just to add to that, why we built Connect the way we did, yeah. anchored it in the cloud, because we can talk to the cloud back end of your UC service to pull there and send out. Just one of the things that's available for on the Microsoft side today will be coming later this summer for Zoom is going to be the ability to ingest SRT into the Zoom meeting to be able to deliver a return feed or play content into right. that meeting. And we see that consistently full round trip from us interacting live in Zoom to the return feed being delivered into the call is right around or below two seconds. And that's full on out of Zoom into the production switcher, switched, graphics added, produced, and sent back. And I just want to emphasize just how cool what, what Julian just said there is. It kind of, kind of buried the lead on this one. But if you wanted to use Zoom as a CDN, right, and, and maybe multiple webinars and multiple meetings receiving the same play out, from your production system, this is a great way to do that. You're gonna bring it into Epifan's cloud ecosystem and then you're gonna use Connect to push it out to all the edge nodes and Zoom can just act like another low latency CDN option uh, for horizontally scaling your event, which which could be super interesting as we think about a lot of different models and digital first and things like that. Like that could be a superpower for ingest into Zoom as a playout system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next question. George E. Kennedy, Washington, D.C., here on the panel. Besides Zoom and Teams, what other sources can be brought into Epifan Connect? So right now, Connect is simply Zoom and Teams, like we've been talking. It's grabbing raw video feeds from the meeting, converting them to SRT, and delivering them to your production tool. Uh, just like, you know, we started with the, the purple guys, we added Zoom, we've got Andy here, and it's, you know, it's, it's been great. We're, we're always looking to expand that roster of partners, uh, really based on demand from folks like yourselves. I mean, we've, we've heard names like Cisco, we've heard names like Google, and it's really just going to be, you know, based on all of our conversations, is there another one that folks are saying, hey, I need this to produce my show? Next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When deploying multiple Epifan Connect instances for more than five video captures, does the usage cost scale linearly to a multiple of each or uh, to a multiple of each instance activated? Yes, it does. So it'd be $25 per hour per instance. If again, you're someone that's using a lot of these consistently, I really encourage you to talk to us about a reserve capacity plan because that, at that point, you're going to get significant discount on the hourly cost of your hours by saying, hey, I, I know I'm going to be running office hours all the time and our shows are two hours long and we, we're going to have you know, 300, you know, 300 hours this year and there's, there'll be a huge cost savings off of that, that main hourly rate commit ahead of time. Next question. Mickey Makachor in uh, Manila in the Philippines. What are the capabilities of both the hardware encoders and Epifan Connect in terms of re return video and return audio? Are there mix minus capabilities built in? So I'll, I'll just touch on the Connect side. And I think Dan can speak to kind of using the, the hardware side and the productions. But again, Connect is we are simply taking SRT out of, out of the raw feeds from Zoom and delivering it somewhere. And then once we add that capability later this summer, we'll be able to bring one SRT feed with audio, again, tied to the video back into the Zoom meeting and deliver it to, like Andy said, use Zoom potentially as your CDN. Uh, the hardware can also return that video. And Dan will talk a little bit about how, uh, how it does that. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, it's the advantage of using Zoom as your acquisition in your acquisition workflow is that it does the mix minus for you. So, you know, it's happening. It's happening in the cloud before you even receive your audio. You've got your mix minus. You've got your isolated audio feeds. As far as the hardware, Epifan, your audio arrives with your video. What you do with it from there is up to you. You've got outputs on on the hardware devices that you can use to route your audio to your mixing board or wherever you might want to do that. Next question. 
Georgie Kennedy Jr., Washington, D.C., do you have a graphics tool set for Unify? I'm going to let Dan show this one off because we don't have a graphics yeah. tool set, but we let you use the one that uh, that you prefer. Yeah, we do have, in Unify, we do have web-based input as well. So you can use, there's a lot of great graphics tools. And, uh, Is that web-based know, with Alpha? Yes, correct. With Alpha. So you can use something like Floix. You can use something like... Uh, well, I'm, what are you using here? I, we we uh, use SPF curious here, which would, which SPS. would work there. Yeah, so that would work as well. So, you know, do a search. There's there's so many of these graphics tools popping up. And in fact, you know, we've, we, we're have we compatible with anything that uses a web-based input and uh, support the alpha channel as well. That's great. So you can do for that, you know, when you're, even if you're just doing a single pipe or if you want to pass something through, that means that you know you're lower. You could put potentially lower thirds or tickers or um, you know any kind of bug or those kinds of things could be done within your server. You're showing that here, um, and so but that so it, it can get pretty complex. I mean, you can really not maybe not build a show at the same level as vMix, but throwing something together that can be kind of um, to make that work could, could be would be really powerful. So exactly. Uh, Sing- Singular Live is another one that we that we really like, and they've got a new service coming out called Uno that I would encourage people to check out. U N O. Um, but you can pair it up with your Stream Deck so that you can run your your lower thirds, your your tickers, and so forth. I don't know if we have the screen share here, but I'm sampling a little. This is coming in over Uno, which is a a Singular Live tool. Um, oh, so that's what we're looking at right now when we look at the the example that is um, that you have there. Um, that's the I don't, know, I don't know if we can cut to that or not, but yeah, there we go. So yeah, there this we go. Is, and this is Uno? Is that what? Yeah, I'm using this? Uno for this. And it's it's a really simple. What I'm excited about with as far as graphics is the the tools are beca- the web-based tools for graphics are becoming really user-friendly. Um, and it's as simple as grabbing a, a URL and dropping it into your Unify tool to be able to bring those graphics into your production and layer them on top of of, yeah. of your produced content. And I encourage oh, go, yeah, you know, everybody to kind of check out, you know, our, our YouTube channel, our, you know, our LinkedIn posts, you know, some of our, our previous shows that we've done, both, you know, what Dan is doing from NAB, what we did from, from ISC on the floor was basically using this ecosystem and this tool set to deliver, you know, show it look like that example with the full switching graphics titling. And we've done, uh, if you're kind of, and if someone was asking about Panopto, if you're interested in that, we did a panel with uh, four universities that use, uh, Pearls in different ways on campus, and uh, three of them were Panopto schools, and they all use it slightly differently. So you can check that out. And for the the media practitioner folks, you can see how Dan was able to cut a uh, you know really nice four person panel show using this tool set. And all of us were just in a meeting. He was extracting us into Unify, right. bringing in the graphics and going. And that's been really the powerful thing about a lot of these tools as they sit on top of Zoom ISO is that we're just in a meeting. Like so, the the yeah. older version of this was. You know, we're grabbing everybody has their own meeting and we grab them all and then we send them back a return and there's all this extra stuff that we had to do. And the fact that we can all just be in a meeting and have that process there is is really it, it, it makes the whole thing feel much more fluid. It gives us a lot more control. It gives us a lot more control on both ends, both as a doing the meeting as well as how it gets out and who's involved like it, for those watching we have extra screens in here so i can see extra things going on data uh my levels other things can be just dropped into a meeting once and then everybody has that return if they choose to and so it's um it's really useful and <laughs> one of the things i was thinking about with some of the stuff that you're talking about also is being able to deliver those screens in some cases using using epifan being able to deliver screens back out that might be feedback screens, uh, you know, confidence screens, all those things can be just part of the meeting, but then also deliver it out to hardware if, if needed. Right. And, and I know kind of we're, we're looking at this from, you know, our, you know, well, everyone else is not me. I'm not the producer, but for, as a, you know, real practitioner who's creating these shows, but, you know, coming from my world previously to Epifan was in, you know, pro AV and delivering teams rooms and dealing with those end users every day who want to use UC to communicate. And what we found and why we started building connect and kind of our, our, our vision with this is we need to make it easier for those folks to contribute and deliver that better quality video. And uh, I think the best quip I've heard from any of the guys in the team was, you know, we, we need to make this tool CFO proof. And I think of, you know, some of the folks in my family that are, you know, more Older folks have been in senior roles and they know really know how to use Teams and Zoom. They can jump on a meeting, they can interact, they can share their screen, they can do everything. But like we asked the question about StreamYard earlier, if I send them a WebRTC link to something else, 
I'm getting a phone call from my father saying, what the heck is this? How does it work? What do I plug, you know, what do I click? Where does it plug in? What do I do? Whereas if it's a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting, cool, we're, we're doing what we're doing every day and they don't have to think about it. So there's that lower stress and lower mental load on the, the contributor side as well. So you're able to, as a producer, get better guests to create better content. Yeah. And, and w- that has been a huge issue for us is is definitely as we build events, as we bring pe- people in the ease of use and, you know, and, and making that work has been, I just send you a, a link. I don't have to have you figure out how to use a new tool. And for us, we're a little lazy. So we we use Zoom for mo- almost everything, 99% of what we do, because we have a lot of technical issues with Teams, <laughs> like with hardware. <laughs> as soon as, if you just turn it on, on your on your computer, it's okay. Uh, if you plug <laughs> hardware in, you're just like, Teams is like, I don't know what to do with this. And so, so the, uh, and and that's the one thing that we, the, but, but it definitely makes a difference to have, um, to have, to have it be something that everyone's already using. And it's not this foreign thing that they have to figure out from from the ground up uh next question josh kaufman's up next from philadelphia and he says are there any dashboard tools to notify users of connect instances that are potentially left on after the completion of a broadcast auto shutdown features to prevent unintended usage costs so we have uh right now you will get notifications time based on it it's running for a long time uh we do have a bit of an auto shutdown functionality. If the meeting ends, it will boot the bot, as you can imagine, and it'll shut down. And if the bot sees itself alone for a duration of time, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, it will also kill the bot. Bot will go, hey, it's it's just me here. Nothing's going on. This ended. Um, all dashboard based, and like Dan was saying, in, in showing cloud, we do have notifications there. So we we are working uh, potentially future feature that's getting worked on starting on the unify side may fall into connect to being able to set a time limit ahead of the meeting when you start it up uh the reason that we haven't had that yet frankly was feedback from a lot of you folks that i don't want to worry about if someone told me the show is going to be two hours and it goes three hours or you know two hours 15 minutes and i set it at two hours we heard loud and clear the worst possible thing was to auto shut down on you so we we per we didn't insert that functionality uh ahead of time but it's something that we've got as process. someone who's done a lot of satellite work, that is your, <laughs> that is the huge. Tr- someone's going over, and now you're calling the satellite. You know, can, can we keep that? Can we keep that transponder up? Can we keep the truck up? Can we keep all the? You know, so I think that you're spot on there. Uh, next question. Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana, has this one. As you interact with clients, what skills do you observe that need the most improvement? That is, what skills are new clients lacking and what skills can you identify that actually came from formal education or training? And he boils it all down in the last phrase. Where do we find skilled crews? I think this is the uh, million dollar question across the industry right now. Hear it from everybody. I think uh, we like to, you know, Folks, especially on the kind of the integration side of Pro AV, like to joke that, hey, we all kind of fell into this. And it's, and, you know, on the broadcast side, it's, I, I hear similar things, but it's, you know, hey, I started in TV, you know, Alex has talked about doing satellite in the past. You know, I got a job at my college radio station, College TV. For me, I was just the guy that liked building computers. So I'd get asked, and, and as a economics major, of, hey, the, the display doesn't work. You think you can figure this out? And I thought it was kind of cool and, and ended up doing this. I think, uh it's 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 tough to look at formal ed that way but i I don't know dan if you've got more thoughts there too but there's a lot of folks that i'm seeing doing like hey tv and radio programs Mm -hmm. in their colleges or high schools my high school now has they stream everything and it's students that run it so looking for folks like that but it's 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 the challenge for everybody right now across finding skilled labor yeah you know it's super interesting because on the pro AV side, we are hearing that there is a growing skills gap and the amount that you need to understand about networking and complex, you know, navigating through secure networks and things like that can be difficult. Um, that's where I think the future in the cloud is actually super beneficial because we've got this younger generation who is kind of like the, the Twitch streamers today are going to be, you know, all looking for jobs in a, in a few years, maybe in, in professional organizations and they have the skills and we just need to make sure that we get, offer them the training and that's why Epifan has, you know, like a YouTube channel full of training videos. Uh, you know, we just need to help them get their hands on these tools so that they can be pr- producing this high end professional content. And I think that uh, there's there's a path to success for the new generation to to enter the world and uh, cloud is going to help with that. Yeah, and it's actually one of the reasons this show is run as a team is to give people the opportunity. It gives people the opportunity to have a cloud experience, you know, or have a 
uh, you know, we this show is a, a small village that lights up every day between the panelists and the people on the back end and the people and what a lot of people are learning is how all this works and how to coordinate the team. You know, it may not be the exact tools that they're going to use everywhere, but it gives them that opportunity. So it, it it's something that we generally that's how I've done things in the past is that we provide some way that people can learn how to do it. And then, and then we find the people that can do it and hire them. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, and so, so that's the, the um, so that's, that's definitely the process. And so next question. Alexander Knight, Vancouver, British Columbia back. I love the features, but for a small podcast production, such as what I work on, the cost is high. Right now I screen scrape to keep costs down. Is this an appropriate solution for someone that only has one or two remote guests? Go ahead, Danny. So I'll speak to a little bit about like Zoom's guidance on production, and then I'll look forward to hearing what Dan and Julian think as well. Um, ultimately, it comes down to using the appropriate tool for the type of project that you're doing, right? I mean, there's going to be you know, if it's a small broadcast production, right? I don't necessarily know if a, if a full cloud workflow is necessarily the most efficient way of going about that. It could be certainly very interesting though. Um, but on the Zoom side, what I would say is that um, you leave a lot on the table when you just screen scrape. You know, you're, you don't have the isolated audio to work with. Uh, the quality is lower. Um, a mouse could go on screen at any point and come across. There's potentially GUI elements, that, so it's not necessarily a clean feed. Um, the standardization might be hit or miss, right? So there's a lot that's left on the table. And that's why we're trying to offer uh, more and more access to the Zoom raw data feeds, right? The ability to, you know, take Zoom ISO and for like 29 bucks a month or whatever and get two NDI outputs that can go into OBS and you can switch a show that way. Like that'll be a measurable increase in quality over just a screen scrape method. Um, but obviously, you know, do, do what your budget lets you be capable of. Don't let that any of that stop you from creating, right? The first thing is to create. But then as you think about, how you scale up from there, I would try to retire the screen scrape workflow as, as soon as possible uh, because it will elevate the quality of the production. And then as you keep stepping up, you're going to find that there's more and more production tools at each level. And now the hope is that Zoom is more directly integrated at every step of that process so that it can be sort of your partner for the remote contribution all the way through your journey. Yeah. And I have found that the quality difference between screen scraping, and I spent a decade screen scraping things, <laughs> the quality difference between Zoom ISO outputs and screen scrape is dramatic to, in my eyes, you know, um, between the two. Yeah. Go ahead, Julian. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I agree with everything Andy said. That's why we built this tool. That's why we've been building our workflows these ways. And it's just, hey, you're going to increase in quality whichever way you step it. I think there's kind of two things I'll add there. One is I always like, I'll put my, uh, my sales headphones on for a second. Yeah, I always like to talk, tell people, you know, we think about where you want to be with your show versus where you are now. It might be small today, but what's the vision? Are you are you gonna? I want I want to help folks deliver and build a tool set that lets them grow and can grow with their show. And that's kind of where we see some of our stuff fitting in. That hey, we can help you take it to the next level and hopefully grow your skills, grow your audience, grow your show, and maybe then you know at some point you're saying, "Epic fan, it's been great. Thanks. I'm building a TV studio." So we've moved on. Uh, but with that, we also uh, will be in the future offering two uh, additional plans. One is going to extract up to nine folks, and one is actually going to be two. Uh, subscription will be the same, but that two extraction plan will be uh, $10 an hour, and then the nine will be about 50 uh, it hasn't been finalized. I don't have an exact release date on that, but you know, Alex would love to uh, hear from you directly and see how, if we can solve your problems together. Next question. Next one comes to us from Keenan Campbell in Nevada in the USA. When I was live in the Epifan live show at NAB, it seemed easy to get the shows set up. What do you do for back channel comms with Pearl? I can speak to that. And Keenan, I enjoyed meeting you uh, remotely, virtually during that uh, NAB production. Um, for our show, Keenan, that we were participating in during NAB, we were using Zoom as our back channel. So we were using in the studio that you were in at NAB, we had Pearl hardware, but we still used Zoom as our communication layer sort of on top of that. So, you know, whether you're producing on the hardware, or whether you're producing in the cloud, Zoom is still a great back channel communication tool, irregardless of where the show is being mixed. Next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Collaboration workflows seem promising. How many users are recommended to be logged into the Epifan Connect dashboard simultaneously? How does the dashboard handle potential user conflicts with the UI? Sure. So on the Connect dashboard itself, we don't have, you know, 
the limit's so high, functionally, it doesn't exist. I don't know the exact number of users you can have on the account, but you can but, all be but in there. But way the more same than time. you should. Yeah, way more than you should. <laughs> um, it's one of those things like the studio account we're talking right now. I think there's 20 people inside of Epifan that could potentially be on the show or, uh, you know, with Dan and I. Um, the, the switcher UI that Dan brought up, you, you can have five people in there at once. Um, so again, a lot of this is more on the pre-show coordination side. We don't really have hard stops. And if I were to start someone's stream at the same time, Dan, it's just a last click win sort of thing right now. Because uh, a lot of these workflows are still very new as the tooling is just just being delivered and, and it's our internal communications and how we set up the show and responsibilities beforehand of, hey, you know, Dan is the primary Zoom extractor guy today and Julian is the backup connect op or vice versa. And then everybody kind of plays in there. And if you see something going wrong, you message, you talk in the back channel and, and, and make it run. Yeah. And, and with the Epifan ecosystem, uh, you can set up a team so you can have different permission sets. Uh, I think there's administrator, user, there's some different roles that you can set up to give the right people the right permissions to access the tools. Next question. Next one comes to us from Mickey Mekachor in the Philippines. Is Epifan Connect able to pull in isolated audio in stereo or are these just mono feeds? How does it handle audio there? I mean, I can think of what Zoom can do. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what's implemented on the Epifan side, but um, what I can say is that the, so obviously Zoom has stereo transport inside of itself, um, but there's also, um, you know, in our SDK, uh, there currently are enumeration components for picking between channels. Now, whether or not those are actually hooked up and, and what we can do in that, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a similar story to where we're at with Zoom ISO, where we are, like I said, we're looking at adding the stereo capabilities to Zoom ISO. And then once we know how that's done, we can go to Epifan and we can advise them about how we structured that on our side. And again, this is the power of what that journey was, is that we built Zoom ISO to force Zoom to look at these things, to build an app and prove that it could be done. And then we have sort of a yellow brick road that other developers can follow and say, all right, here's our, here's all the APIs and here's how they're structured and here's the permission hierarchies and here's how all that data flows. We, we're going to know all that stuff. So I think today, if I had to guess, guys, I think it's going to probably going to be mono. Um, and I think, though, that there are things that are available or that are coming soon that will help us get to stereo. Epifan Connect does, does support stereo, even though we may not be receiving it yet. We do support stereo, 48 kilohertz, uh, and you can select your audio bit rate as well. So there, there's some configurable options in there of how you want to uh, conform your audio settings. For, you know, as as our name implies, we're, we're more video guys, so we get more excited about the video quality settings and what we can control there. But we've built the audio uh, the same way, so we're we're able to to scale it and stabilize it for you in that connect layer, so that you're delivering consistent audio out. And last question for the hour: Douglas Carmichael wonders if the Pearl units can be controlled via OSC. Go ahead, Julian. Yeah, that's not right now. Uh, so the pearls are going to be your, you know, controlling them through our cloud panel, through either di you know direct login via the IP if you're on the same network, or we also have integrations right now on the Pro AV side with you know the Crestrons, the QSys, the Xtron of the world that you can use that room control system to automate the pearl streaming, and you might even build that you know touchless or you know, real self serve studio off of that sort of system like we see a lot of our universities do for lecture capture or just self serve spaces that if you press go it can the pearl knows hey my srt destination is unify or this other production studio and and the users uh, running it that way and then the producer has cloud to control it from there uh, it's something that we're always looking to expand uh, based on demand and, and kind of see how that evolves as this this partnership grows dan julian andy so it's really, really great to have you on for the hour. I, uh, just, this is really great. I'm really excited about where you're going. I, I was in LA and I drove, I drove really hard to make sure I got back to, so, that I got, so that I could hang out with all of you here today. And it was worth it. It was just really, really worth uh, seeing all of you here and, and really learning. I think I'm really excited about um, about Epifan and what you guys are doing and, and the outputs. I mean, it's really grown. I mean, I've seen Epifan grow from very small, like little converters, <laughs> you know, to, <laughs> to, to where you are now. It's, it's kind of an, it's a very amazing track, you know, um, that, that you're, that you've done here. So, uh, we're really excited about it. Um, looking forward to testing some of this stuff ourselves and, uh, seeing where we can plug it into the pipeline. So thank you so much for your time. And yeah, thank, thanks, thanks, Alex. Thanks it's us. great to be yeah, here. Yeah, it's been great.
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thanks to our producers for all the great questions, keeping this all rolling. Thanks to the panelists. Can't do this without you. And thanks to the incredible team that we were just talking about that makes this actually work day after day, seven days a week. Um, this little village comes together and puts together a show. So uh, thank you so much for the hard work. And uh, we traveled 84,000 miles today uh, with the questions, 136,000 kilometers. And uh, that is 672 bananas for scale. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. And now we'll jump into After Hours. I'm trying to think about where to put this, where to get it. Instance. Where to put it in. Where? Thinking on it. Exciting. I just need more, more cloud. But is it like cotton candy? You can just keep stuffing it into something forever. The cloud just keeps stuffing it. Just keep stuffing it into the same box. It just gets denser and denser. But, but just like cotton candy, if you pour water on it, it just disappears. <laughs>